Hey, how's it going? You are here for Heavy Art Talk. And tonight we have Mark Riddick back in the house and we're doing a live Q&A. So guys, feel free to, you know, post in the chat. Let us know you're here. Um, at the end of the day, it's just a good excuse for me and Mark to chat. Uh, it's been, at least in terms of the video, it's been since the last live drawing that we, we yeah. spoke. Yeah, that was, I don't know, a month ago or more. Yeah. yeah, I think it was like right at the end of January. Gosh, really? Was it? Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, almost two months. All right. Cool. Yeah, yeah it was fun, man. That was a good exercise. Yeah. yeah. Actually, uh, Mark, uh, Gerald, uh, just reached out to me before we hopped on here, inquiring yeah. about one of the sketches. The goblin? Yeah. yeah so. I just did I just did some yeah. touch-ups like 20 minutes ago because I'm awesome. about to send it over as well. Yeah, I got I got to find it. I don't know where I put it. I think it's it got buried in the stack somewhere. It's probably in a box up here in my studio, so I got I to gotta track it down. I was thinking I might go ahead and like do an inked version of it too, just, just for fun, you know? Yeah, I was on the fence about the ink, but I just did like a tighter pencil and like um, oh, yeah, I okay. broke out some different, you know, like uh, lead strengths or like darkness. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So it just kind of has a little more of a dynamic look to it. Yeah, beefing it up a little bit. Yep, yep. And like anatomical things, you know, it's like oh, maybe that eye should be just a little here, you know, right. that kind of thing. But, yeah, it's funny because when you're drawing on a whim like that, you're not you're not really focused on those intricacies, you know, you're just really trying to get the general form down without paying a lot of attention to all the details, you know, so. Yeah. Kind of going off instinct. Like I, yeah. I looked up, it wasn't even a, a male person, but I just looked like side profile view and I looked up some like female models and I was like, okay, cheekbone should be here. And oh, right, right. Just like little things like that. Like it looks nothing like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a goblin, you know, yeah. words and all. But having the reference points like that really helps inform like what you're doing. You just all it does is give you a better end product, you know. So yeah, for sure. Have that. It's kind of like when we do that. What was that house thing that we? I can't remember what, what that was called again. The Baba Yaga. Yeah, I was like, well, I didn't know what the hell that was. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, okay, now I I get it, you know. But um, yeah, it was cool, man. It's cool to be able to draw something that I was completely unfamiliar with. That was that was fun. Yeah, let's see. We got a comment from uh, Jeff here. So this is uh, that that dragon commission I did the T-shirt. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. This is uh, the client. So Jeff Gasmaster Hand Grenades. Oh, he oh. he's one of my favorite YouTube channels because he yeah. has these really cool. Um, they're like not press, but they're interviews. So it's like fan to fan interviews. So like it yeah. goes to like a lot more depth than like your typical press type interviews i really yeah. dig it i need to revisit because i i've seen i've seen jeff's channel before i just, I, I, I should check it out and subscribe because um i remember enjoying it i just haven't been back there in a little bit but um so that was that's what that commission was for that you're working on that's yep gas mass and hand grenades okay cool did you finish it and send it out already or yeah that's what i had on the thumbnail i got the original back here too but yeah i finished that okay. up okay cool yeah i thought so look looked completed but i remember seeing at some point, a little progress. Um, I think it was like, a, I th think you may have sent a progress pick of it to me before mm. uh, through text message or something. So yeah, that's cool, man. That, that turned out really well, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, the I think that was one of my better ones. The details is insane on that thing, man. I mean, it's almost like pseudo lifelike. The, the way the wing is rendered, it, I feel like it feels almost like you could touch it. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes yeah. it, it's, it's done with such finesse that it has a like a real life lifelike looking texture to it. Thanks, really man. Well done, man. It means a ton. Yeah, dude, I'm I'm nearly done with that uh, werewolf piece. I'll show it probably later because there's that question of like, what's the most challenging piece? And Ooh, from a yeah. pen and ink perspective, this thing's been kicking my ass, and I've had to do so much. It's been a very good lesson in patience and preparation. Uh, yeah. But I'll talk about that a little later. Yeah, and that, that one actually kind of reminded me, um, hearkening back to the King Diamond tribute piece that you had worked on, just yeah. the idea of utilizing frames to literally help frame parts of the piece in, uh, it, it kind of spoke, I, I feel like that's a note that you probably took from something you did in the past, hence that King Diamond piece that you did, you know, I don't know, a year ago or more. Um, but the, the werewolf piece, I remember you you sharing that too, That that was just super com complicated and for me it looked like something that i would hate to have to ink <laughs> so, 
I can't imagine. Dude, you just put a huge challenge in front of yourself. But the good thing is that once it's complete, it'll have a place to live and print, you know. So it's 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 for a good cause. It's for a publication. So to get some um some good shelf life on it, you know. Which yeah. Is good. For sure, man. And like amongst really good company at just public service announcement for the chat. So our mutual friend, Tyler Pennington, uh, creep from six feet deep, him and his uh, colleague, uh, her name's Sarah. They both are putting on cursed issue two and it's pre-order right now. And uh, Tyler's actually going to be raffling off a original painting of his oh. to just somebody who pre-orders it. And like, Regardless of winning the painting, which would be awesome, which I have a chance at because I pre-ordered it, which would be awesome for my collection. But um, it's just a really good magazine for the scene. I mean, it's always awesome. Pen and ink, mostly uh, artists and illustrators. But then there's like literature in there, too. Like it's something truly unique. So, yeah, you know what it reminds me of? I, I, I remember uh, taking a creative writing course in high school when I was part yeah. of a literature literary magazine that the uh, that we put out every year i got that was sort of my first time dabbling in graph design or pre-press print process but it, it's ultimately it was this uh literary magazine that was art and poetry art and sto short stories things of that nature and that's what because i had that that first issue of cursed as well and yeah it, it's really just a, a brilliant publication it's a great marriage of those two ideas and it's only, it kind of reminds me, it, it made me think of a literary magazine I used to work on, you know, yeah. and, and it just, it was almost like a version of that, but on steroids, because it seemed to sort of pseudo thematic. And I know the next issue is definitely going to be, it clearly has a theme to it. Um, but um, it's, it's definitely worth every penny. Great, great quality printing uh, and great quality content. A lot of great uh, artists contributing to that pub. Yeah, totally. And shout out to uh, Skylar, Skull and Sword Art, and Gaz, who goes by Brutal Whimsy on Instagram. What's up? But yeah, um, we got the Q&A today. So we have about like eight questions in advance for people in the chat. If any other you know questions come to mind, I'll be keeping an eye on it. And then in between the uh, you know kind of already prepared questions, I can pop them up. Um, but really, you know, at the end of the day, we're just we're chilling on a Saturday night, right? So, um, it's you know, you're just getting Lee and Mark in the raw, basically. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> nothing, nothing too built up here. But I guess here, just before we get into that, like, uh, let's talk music for a minute. You've been sure. listening to anything new recently, or what's been on the rotation? Yeah. Actually, I, I I know you've asked this of other folks, so I've actually pulled. Some I'm always stuff. curious, man. Always curious. Yeah. I said I'll, I'll try to be brief because um, I can I can kind of go off when it comes to, to this sort of stuff. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Sovereign from Norway. Uh, oh, dude, that thing rules. You have this? Dark yeah. Descent Records. Yeah, and uh, I think Scalvador did the artwork on it. I'm not sure if Scott, I apologize because I can't remember his true name. That's his handle on um, social media. I need to follow okay. him. I don't think I have. Um, anyhow, I'm getting a bit of a glare there, so I apologize. But uh, it's I I first uh, checked out their demo on uh, Redefining Darkness, and it's probably one of my all-time favorite demo tapes. Nice. It's even better than the album. Don't get me wrong, this album kicks ass, but uh, the demo is just the songs totally, like, totally rip. Um, but this is kind of reminds me of like a – it's – it's almost like they went on from the demo and, and took on a more like sci-fi ass sort of raw. Um, it's almost like Oblivion from Canada, the old thrash band, Oblivion, Death Thrash, uh, but more raw uh, uh, sound to it. Yeah. But it's really good. The cool thing about Sovereign is that on this album, they're playing like technical Death Thrash, which is really what I've been listening to a lot of lately, which you're going to see here with my collect, what I pulled set aside. Yep. Um, but they have catchy riffs too, and I love the the sort of raspy vocals as well. Uh, but these these were cool enough to like hook me up. I did a shirt for them uh, to accompany the album release, so they they just oh, uh, nice. the band just sent this to me about a week or two ago, and I, I've been actually I haven't spun the vinyl yet, but I've been spinning the CD in my in my car. Um, oh yeah, dude. 
so a couple other items. Um, speaking of like tech death rash type stuff, um, this is a band called Suspiria, and uh, I have their second demo tape from the I think like early '90s, early mid '90s, and they're an Illinois-based uh, technical death rash band. But uh, I, this is a repress by Dive Bomb Records. They okay. do a lot of represses of like classic, like long lost, obscure thrash type stuff mostly. But uh, Suspiria, uh, I I had their demo, and I remember when I when I when I got it, I just I think I was too young to really wrap my head around what it was I was hearing. Mm -hmm. So I only got like two or three listens, and that's it, because I was more into like rudimentary death metal. This is probably too too technical for my young reptilian brain to understand at the time. So um, I picked it up on CD and it has their first demo too. And I actually, when I heard the second demo again, I was like, wow, this is actually way better than I remember. And the first demo is even better because it has more like, it's more guttural, a little bit more dirtier production. So it's like really, really good technical death rash, excellent riffs, kind of like early Vader type stuff. Um, one, one second on that. Yeah. That uh, the cover there, that yeah. like little sliver over the eye of like yeah. the light peering through yeah. a doorway, dude. It's that's so choice, man. man. Yeah, it's almost like the shape of a dagger too, which is kind of yeah. you know, it, it's really it's a great painting. I'm not sure who painted that. I I, I apologize. I, like I, those little decisions, like for me, yeah. sometimes well, it's like you look at them so long when you're actually mm -hmm. creating them that you kind of like doubt, like, did I am I actually getting this light correct? You know, in like a realistic yeah. way. Because I'm like dealing with a light problem right now, so I'm kind of projecting. Oh, right. <laughs> it's funny, but I yeah, that's really cool, man. I've been looking at this cover. I didn't even notice it until just now that you pointed it out. How much effect that has on it. That oh man, it pops. Uh, this is another one um, I found. That I actually had to hunt down. That's and a cool it, cover too. Yeah, it's pretty unusual. I think this is from like 1990. It's a band called Magase from from Germany, and. I happened upon them uh, via YouTube, just looking up some like tech, tech death rash type stuff. And uh, I hit up Ken from uh, Ken's death metal crypt. I was like, dude, do you have this? Of course he freaking has it on vinyl, the original, you know, cause he has everything. Oh man. So I was like, dude, <laughs> I've been having a hard time tracking down. I finally tracked it down. I had an order from Germany for like 80 bucks or something, but oh, it's, man. it's, um, Musically, it's freaking amazing, like hyper technical, super fast, really insane, like guitar shredding, almost like like Nocturnus in a way. Yeah, um, you can tell that Nocturnus is quite inspired by Magase. But the interesting thing about Magase is that they were a female fronted band, and the vocals are like kind of hit or miss. Like she's out of key a lot, but when she does the harsh vocals, they sound like early Noctur like Nocturnal from uh, Germany. So it's it's to the point where, like where the music's so great it doesn't matter so much about the vocals you know and they're not bad they're just like an acquired taste you know um so i've been digging that another one new 20 bucks been released the simulator uh i think this is members of um uh some canadian bands i want to say uh Cthilist. i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that right yeah i think it might be some of the dudes that help warm out. I can't remember. Yeah, um, Katila's guitar player is in Worm, Phil? right? I think so. I think Phil. I think I'm not sure if he's in this band or some of his other bandmates are in this band. I can't remember. I, I should look more closely, but uh this is really good technical death rash. It's it's again sort of like the Canadian sound, kind of like again, oblivion, uh things like that, you know. Um the what I like really like about this album is the tone too is like the best guitar tone it's super razor sharp it's got that metallic kind of sound to it mm -hmm. and the songwriting is excellent on here it's really catchy almost kind of i don't i don't know if you're familiar with ghoul you know yeah. ghoul, ghoul's got those really cool chunky thrash riffs the simulator has that too in some of their songwriting i wouldn't compare them to ghoul so to speak like they're not in the same realm of metal uh but there's a there's a similarity in that regard they've got like really cool ch chunky riffs um i'll just do these real quick i grab these cavalera um represses or re-recordings yep i'm kind of on the fence about them i want to say because morbid visions is one of my favorite albums 
I, I, I had to say I like the original more, but I had I had to um, give them some accolades for doing a great job of trying to like really capture that old sound again in a sort of slightly tighter fashion. But um, as far as tracking it down, I'd probably pass on more divisions, but definitely maybe check out uh, BCL, BCL Devastation because I feel like that one is um, – is worth it because the, the, the sound is a lo- it's different it's a little bit different it's like chunkier heavier than the original but the songs are still, still really good um people probably have mixed feelings about them re-recording their old stuff but i, I have to give them credit they actually did a like a pretty reasonable job on it um, yeah snet is yep, another yep and i think um, it's pretty bare bones, like death metal. Like it, it borrows from a lot of different genres. I feel like I feel like I hear some Finnish death metal, some bolt thrower, a mix of of things in in this band. And it, it's it's like it's okay for me, but I've I've been spinning that a lot lately. I I had a colleague um, play this in their cards. They're like, hey Mark, tell me. Like he doesn't listen to metal at all. He's like, just tell me a band. I, this is the first one that popped in my head because I had not heard <laughs> it yet. Okay. Like, I don't know what they sound like, you know? I said, look up Snet. Cause I don't, I don't do digital. He has a Spotify or whatever. I don't do anything like that. So I'm like, I heard in his car for the first one I was like, Oh, this is actually not bad. I, I should pick this up. So I went to blood harvest, picked it up, grabbed the shirt while I was at it. Um, but this is the, the jewel that I've been listening to. It's a, uh, it's death row from Germany. Okay. I, I picked this That's up. Technical kind of death thrash, right? Or it's thrash. Yeah. Right? yeah so Marty warm, on heavy metal liturgy, liturgy mentioned this album i think they're going over records from 89 or something like that yeah and i remember hearing him describe it i was like oh man that sounds like something i would like so i looked it up and i was like yeah this is cool so i i grabbed it i i'd heard them back in 89 on that um uh the noise compilation um why is the name leaving me right now the noise compilations that they, that, that, that they put out during the uh, late 80s early 90s God, why is I don't know what wasn't there a death metal comp that had it, like Halloween on it and stuff? Yes, it did. I've got it on vinyl. Why can't I think of the name? Anyway, Death Row was on it, so I heard them back then. And it was like one of those bands that it, it was cool, but I was more into like coroner and creator at the time, you know? Yeah. But Death Row, dude, this album is so so good. Uh it's like that it sounds the vocals are kind of like Death Angel a little bit. But musically, they're a lot like super technical, um, kind of like um, kind of like their label mates, uh, Vendetta, sort of a little bit of Mordred, okay, uh, in there as well, like and and Watchtower, like some of their label mates. But this is like when Marty described this as riff for days. He was not joking. There's so many riffs on here. There's very little repetition, and I love that because there's nothing cookie cutter about this release. They do so much. To expand on on the riffs and each song and it's just it's so good it's very versatile i, I love this album i'm glad that marty recommended it and now i now i want to know it's probably one of my favorites so i've been on a bit of a tech death rash binge in the last month or two anyhow that's that's what that's what's been spinning on my end i've got like 30 or 40 cassettes i haven't listened to yet a couple other cds that have come in that i haven't had a chance to check out so i got to go through all those at some point too but what pretty much, name? pretty much sticking in metal lately. Uh, well, today I listened. Are you talking about me or you? You, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, but today I listened to like Power Station and okay. uh, Depeche Mode. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, man, can't go wrong with that. Here, yeah. let me grab a couple things. I got to think about because a lot of stuff I'm listening to in my car is in my car. And oh, then yeah. At the gym, I'm just doing Spotify. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me grab a couple things. It'll only take a second. Doomsday News, that's the name of the comp I was trying to think of. Doomsday News, I think it was Doomsday News 2 that had um, uh, the uh, death row on it. Antoine is in the room. Oh, Antoine. Okay, so uh, gas masks and hand grenades mentions that the simulator features Antoine uh, from uh, Cthulhu. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. That's cool. Appreciate the clarity on that, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, dude. 
All right, so let's see what to pick with. You know what? We'll keep in heavy metallurgy here. I got to give credit to Marty for turning me on and getting me to be a Halloween fan. Yeah. Um, I actually kind of slept on Walls of Jericho for a long time, and I've like been listening to it, but I recently purchased it. It was uh, pretty cheap. I think this is an Icarus pressing. It's okay. Got two discs. Yeah, but yeah, man. Um, I'm really enjoying this album. It's very catchy. It's a little bit different. Um, yeah. I just feel like for the speed kind of early power metal, like it's one of the better ones. So oh, really I agree. digging it. I agree. I'm a sort of a latecomer to Halloween too. Um, I remember knowing about them years ago, but um, not picking them up until about maybe six or seven years ago. Good yeah. stuff. Though. I really like them. Yeah, definitely been listening to that. Let's see. Um, 20 bucks spin slime Lord. Yeah, I saw that. I, I thought I was on the fence about that one. I didn't pick it up. But I, was like, I, I really like it, man. Have you listened to it? Uh, for maybe like 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's my kind of like vibe with death metal. I mean, it's like lurchy, but there's enough cool like psychedelic ideas to keep me interested. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Brad Moore artwork, you know, oh, got yeah. support. So um, not this next week uh, for the guys in the chat, but the week after um, Brad's back on the show in terms of, you know, being published, but he went like on like an hour long explanation about the process of creating this painting. And like Brad Moore is a great speaker and a great storyteller. So highly, highly engaging. So if you want to learn more about that painting two weeks from now, you'll learn some more. That's cool. Yeah. I think I have a slime Lord uh, demo tape. Yeah. If I recall correctly. I might, I might, pick, I might go back and grab that, that album. I mean, it's definitely not like technical death thrash. Like it's that murky kind of like sound. But like, for me, it's the the psychedelic, the interesting production choices. I mean, there's like freaking geese in the beginning. Like I just like that they're pushing the boundaries a bit. And like the um, because like I I, I spent so much money with um, you know, twenty bucks spin, dude. But the the Sivirus album that came out yesterday, I thought was exceptional as well but i you know i was kind of like all right i'm done buying 20 bucks stuff for yeah. a while but then i listened to it and i was like no this is really good oh i haven't i haven't checked that out yet it's it's very good um there especially towards the end of the album there's like some really interesting like clean sections and almost like these like orchestral stuff that's like cinematic mm -hmm. um and but not like emperor like um yeah. i don't know how to describe it but there's a progressive feel it's, the drumming's really good on the cypress okay. album Okay. Are so this UK? is are they a UK band super are they UK? Uh no, California. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is just like some really ignorant dumb shit that I bet a lot of people won't like, but for me it's fun, especially at the gym. Snuffed at snipe, uh, snuffed on site. So it's like brutal tough. death metal, but it's also they play for hardcore kids, so it's like mm -hmm. it's in that vein. They're uh they just seem like interesting personalities like i watched like a garza interview with them and i guess i just like that it's like silly and stupid and there's like there's like trap samples and stuff like that's if, maggot stomp, right maggot stomp. yeah maggot stomp and uh some other labels too uh mm. creator destructor oh yeah, so yeah I, if you didn't like this uh anybody in the chat or mark like i would totally understand but for me it's like it just makes me want to lift weights man which is you know what it, the cover reminds me of a, a, a combination of dying fetus and internal bleeding mashed up. I just, just see the Joker, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very comic book. They, they've got that hardcore hooded dude on there. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, I might have to look that up. It's interesting. Uh, and then something non metal Chemical Brothers Surrender. Hmm. Great, oh, like, um, 90s house dance mm -hmm. kind of psychedelic music. Just, like, really good, like, it's got that pulse, you know? That yeah. kind of house beat pulse. Very nice. And then uh, this this album was kind of hard to get for a while on CD. or Not hard, but kind of expensive. But I saw it come up. Benediction. Oh, yeah, classic. Yep. So, yeah. Ben's got a question for you, Mark. You see that? Yeah, um, so um, I was in touch with Scott 
from Magistomp to put out to repress a lot of the old extra set material, as well as some other recordings I, I found that were never published. And um, and I hadn't heard from him in a while. I know he's been busy. He's got his career and his label to deal with. Um, and then uh, Gurgling Gore expressed an interest in putting it out. So I was like, that's cool. Let me check with Magistomp just to be sure. Like, and so Magistomp re expressed an interest in putting it out. So um, where it stands right now, I just have to finish pulling files together because I think some of the files I lost when my computer crashed uh, a couple of years ago. So I'm trying to track down getting all the stuff put together and sent out to um, to Magistomp. So hopefully we'll we'll get maybe a cassette release. He expressed an interest in maybe vinyl too, but I I, I don't know. I don't, I personally don't think some of the material is good enough for vinyl. Um, but thanks for asking, uh, Brain Smasher. I appreciate that. I don't know anything about this project. What years, roughly, were you recording this stuff? Uh, we rec- I was a project I did with my twin brother uh, for a couple of years when we were in high school, and we did it. We cut a, a demo as well. I think after college, um, I want to say like ninety two, ninety three. We put some demos out, and uh, all this stuff got repressed on cassette by a Costa Rican label hmm. about 10 years ago, maybe. And then um, I found some more recordings. And then anyway, um, we just cut two demo tapes. And then a third one, um, I think I self-published that, I, that was never previously released. And that was probably our best material. But it's a project that we did, uh, it was death metal. Um, at one point, we had a, it was all drum machine, but we had a human drummer rehearsal with um eric sanga who, who played in dying fetus for a little bit um played drums with us so i got a couple of, like sessions with him on tape it's all like rudimentary like four track recordings you know so the drum machine's like very mechanical sounding so it's very unusual kind of like i don't know what to compare it to maybe like early mysticum like their sound their drum machine sound i don't know it's just really weird drum machine sound very process sounding um it was good. I mean, it was cool stuff, kind of like heavy suffocation influence, I would say. Oh, it's up my alley, man. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all it's all floating around on YouTube. <laughs> Some of that stuff. I'll have to <laughs> check it out, dude. I mean, I the last fetid zombie album you put out, I thought was really, really good. I was pleasantly surprised at how good it was. And yeah. it, and like you know, kudos to you, but like you also got a really good set of contributors, man. I yeah. think that was a big part of it too. Yeah, that's what makes that happen. You know, is you get those other perspectives on the music, and I, I actually that's probably the one album that I think I spent the most time on, just sort of sitting on, stewing on, you know, changing things. You know, after a year of like listening to it, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I it. Of all the stuff I put out musically, that's probably one of the things that I'm most content with. Uh, And that project is sort of just all over the place anyway. You know, it's just sort of whatever I feel like doing at the time. Yeah. And I haven't really been super inspired since that album. So I don't, I haven't really picked up my guitar much in the past few years. So it's just sort of maybe eventually I'll get back to it. I I did put a, a cassette out recently, but that was all stuff recorded during the pandemic you know, after that album, but not anywhere, not, not the same intent or sound as that album. You know, it's more like stripped down death metal, uh, with some, a little bit of melody tossed in the mix. Yeah. No, man, but it's cool too. Like learning that you were even creating music in like the early to mid nineties. I had no idea at that point you were doing it. And like, I guess sometimes I forget, like, cause we're different generations. Like, I mean, you got into death metal right when it was coming up. Oh, you know yeah. What I mean, mm-hmm. and like, that's just, it's an experience that I'll never have. And a lot of people won't either. But I always find those stories of tape trading in the early days yeah. so interesting. It, you know? it was awesome, man. I mean, it's all before internet. And I feel like, even just speaking to like my art as a brand, I feel like that, that helps inform it. Yeah my experience in, in my youth helped inform what I do now. And it, it's just, um, it was cool, man. Like the, 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 the atmosphere, 
you know, of that time period is so different from like the sterile process of clicking a mouse and typing on a keyboard, you know, yeah. you know to describe notes to people. Uh, it's, you know, like even before we hopped on here, I mentioned Roy was doing that death metal demo stream right now. Like Roy is somebody I was in touch with back in like 92, 93. Oh shit. I didn't know that. I had his like first releases, uh, ceremonium seven inch and stuff like that like we you know we're pen pals essentially for a brief period in, in the early 90s you know uh just the, the the number of people that i've crossed paths with is just insane when i think back to um even like one of the one of the bands i think you guys were talking about album covers and somebody pulled an album an album cover of um this band, I forgot what they're called, like Scorched or something. I can't remember. Not, it wasn't that. It was something else. And I, I, I just happened to be on Metal Archives looking up an old band I had done some work for. And so one of the covers somebody was sharing on one of these like cover review things. I think we had done at some point. I can't remember. It's a critique of art or something. We we're mm -hmm. talking about the artwork. I didn't realize it, but I was actually I actually done artwork for one of the band members' bands back in like '92. You know, I didn't, I didn't even make that connection until like two days ago. You know what I mean? So it's, it blows my mind to think that there's still some folks like myself are still really ingrained and active in the scene after yeah. all these years, you know, it just, you, I think once you metals and itch, you just can't stop scratching, you know, for some think, of us. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's something that a lot of fan base just commits to, you know, it's a, it's a living thing for sure. Here, I got one question for you, then let's pivot to, so we have a slide deck that goes over some of the prepared questions, and they're they're mostly art-focused. So for the 13 people watching, if you're only here for music, I hope I can keep your attention and so can Mark. But here's one more before we get to that. Hmm. <laughs> Bostex four track. <laughs> oh. Oh man, okay. Yeah. Oh no, this is the question. I'm sorry. You no, know, it's funny to mention that because I remember, like, I was just thinking about that. I don't even know if I still have all my four tracks. I, I remember going through two four tracks, then the eight track, then a 24 digital track studio. Now, now everything's on the computer. It's so easy. But yeah, like, you know, bouncing the the tracks or the panning, and then having to flip tape over. I don't even remember how to do any of that anymore. So long ago. But as a teenager trying to figure that out, it's crazy. Um, it's crazy how your your ambition really motivates you to learn these kinds of things, you know. When you're yeah. Young. Um, what is this? The singular um, hmm. album? Yes. Um, I'm not huge movie or book person. Um, in terms of like looking for inspiration, so to speak. But um, I remember my dad. He would read a lot of sci-fi, so I'd be exposed to some of the the book covers, uh, which always. I thought was cool. You know, you go to the, the bookstore and see all these cool sci-fi novels. The cover art is really amazing. But I, I'd say for albums, uh, definitely Derek Riggs, uh, Killers, Iron Maiden, for sure. Because I remember standing in line at Record World at the mall in like 83, 82 or 83, and being eye level with uh, Eddie <laughs> on that cover. <laughs> just, and then turning around and seeing, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, Bark at the Moon, all that stuff made... A big impression on me and when i saw that i just thought it was the most fantastical mystical kind of thing i'd ever witnessed as you know my six-year-old mind so I, I i think that is what really sparked my my interest to, to at least to the point to make me say because i was already drawing i already had an interest in art but to see that and, and as a product on a shelf made me think i want to do record covers i want to give you a little focus in a way, yes. And it's not like I went home and said, I'm going to go draw album covers now because it, it took a couple more years before I really knew how to point my my passion in that direction, you know? Yeah. But it was definitely, I would say, a catalyst moment for me, for sure. It's a good Very question. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Well, let's pull this up. This is Fostex. <laughs> All right. So first question is, what is your favorite and least favorite thing for a client to ask you to draw? So you want me to go to the next slide yeah. and you talk? Okay. That's fine. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things I, I can say I probably don't like to draw. One of the, my 
pet peeves is when a request comes in and they're like, hey, draw this army of skeletons or draw all these zombies fighting each other. Not knowing that each each of those figures requires work for me to figure out how to draw them. And a, a, a knowing that it's going to be something that's sort of not even the focal point of a piece seems like a tremendous waste of time to me and very tedious. I could see it maybe happening for an album cover, but for a shirt print, you definitely don't want that. So um, I just pulled a couple examples here of um, previous experience, and I'm not trying to to bash my customers or anything like that. Um, Insanity Alert from Austria, super cool dudes to work with, fun band. Um, but but they what they asked was for quite a lot to take place on their on their album cover, and this actually went through about three or four different variants before we landed on this. Before there was like a skateboarder, there is um, Cobra Commander, there's Slimer, there's all kinds of stuff. And there was Slimer. Yeah, I, if I recall correctly, I did sketch Slimer out for something. Maybe I misinterpreted what they're asking, but whatever the case. Uh, this is where the cover ended up. And it's, you know, I did what I could given all the kinds of things that they wanted in it. I tried to kind of pare it down uh, to come to some kind of compromise so that it would still like work and be balanced in the in the, can the canvas area, so to speak. Uh, so I just try to lean on my um, uh, my graphic design skill set to uh, dictate placement on this piece. So it's, it's fine, like it turned out okay, but there's always a risk of overcomplicating art when you ask for the kitchen sink to be included in it. So you look at the other illustration, it was a demo cover I did for the band Crypt Warm. And it's their, their guidance for me was like, do whatever you want, just do something death metal. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know? And so there's, I feel like the best result comes from like very, very minimal direction, maybe like a little prompt. Yeah, rather than something that requires so much detail and intricacy. This is specifically what we want. This is where we want to be placed. And granted, I've had clients like that, and that's fine. I I don't take commissions like that very often because I know they require a lot more of my time and focus. And doing this freelance, I I I want to be able to turn something around every week, not every three weeks. You know what I mean? So I feel like the cryptworm piece is uh it's easier to interpret as to the lay person visually it's just it's just easier to see it's the information is like right there it's it's not overly complicated and it makes a quick point so when it asks what i want to draw what i don't like to draw is too much stuff what i like to draw is keeping it minimal keeping it simple less is more like that is sanity alert cover might be okay for an album cover, but I don't know how well that's going to translate on a t-shirt. Whereas yeah. Crypt Warm could be used easily for a t-shirt, for a patch, uh, you know, for um, a demo cover, seven inch cover, whatever, you know? Um, so that that's, that's for me, what my preference, uh, where it lies in terms of what I like to draw, what I don't like to draw. What about you, Lee? Do you, are there anything, have you been asked to draw anything that you're uncomfortable with or um, that maybe, you know, is going to be a little more cumbersome? And don't get me wrong, I like challenges, but reasonable ones, you know? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's the same thing. I want like a lot of creative freedom. If anything, I want somebody to kind of tell me what they don't want. So I can just avoid the traps of of like going down a route that they don't want. You know what I mean? Like, because if you think of what I want, that's like narrowing it down to like, I mean, there's always a lot of possibilities. But in my own mind, sometimes it's like, okay, there's like five or six possibilities, the more honed in it gets. But if you say, I don't want something like this, then it's like, okay, I can avoid that and kind of go my own direction. Like, that's another way that a client could give you advice, I think. That sure. could be constructive. Um, yeah, absolutely. But for me, I mean, I, I'm pretty particular with commissions as well, mostly because of the the, the same kind of thing. Like, um, I do this, I do this, you know, just in like my spare time, and like, yeah. I want it to look like my style, and I don't know, it, it it is what it is. You know what I mean? We'll talk a little bit later about like the advantages of full time or kind of like side hustle or part-time. And one of them is yeah. 
you can turn things away if you don't like them. If yeah. you don't think the relationship is going to be good. Yeah, so. and it's funny. Um, drawn toward graphics mentions that I guess maybe he or she has had customers that will provide a Photoshop mock up. I've had that too. Uh, it's sometimes helpful, sometimes not. It just depends. Um, I, I had one recently for a book cover I'm working on, and it wasn't a Photoshop job. It was like a sketch by 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 a, a, a good artist, you know. Um, and he was also involved in this book. But whatever the case, he did a sketch, but it was helpful in the sense that because the book is for something very specific, I needed to know the specificities of what they want because it speaks to the storyline. Your storyline has specificities in it. So I want to make sure I'm kind of capturing the essence of what their brand is, you know, what they're trying to portray. So I kind of get it in that sense. But for an album cover or something like that, yeah, it, it just depends. Like the, the customer has to have the expectation that they're going to get, uh, you know, a drawn sword piece, whatever drawn sword style looks like, or league, league, Lee, if they if they go to you, they <laughs> you don't want to say my last name. Well, huh? well Gwen Gwen Turk, Gwen Turk, I don't know. Man. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, Gwen, Gwen just, Turk. just Lee G, man. That's all I go. Literally Lee or Lee G. So if somebody comes to you, they they you already. I don't know if you believe it. You already have a style. I think you do. Yeah, I think they're, I do. They're, they're going to get a Lee product, you know. So there's they have to come in whether they're providing some guidance or not, they have to come in with the expectation that they're going to get it done in your style with your approach. It's not going to be exactly what they're asking for, but you'll try to find some kind of common ground somewhere. No. Nah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you there. Let's see. Next one. So what makes a great t-shirt design somewhat related? Yeah. Strong composition. And that's just part of it. I mean, contrast is important. Visual harmony repetition, stuff like that is certainly important too. Uh, but I think ultimately what it comes down to is strong composition, especially for printed merchandise. You want the illustration to read okay from a distance, but when you get up close, you can kind of de decipher some of the fine details. You just want it from a distance to kind of like have a good, a good balance to it. Uh, another thing to consider is also just the fact that it's a floating design in space, not necessarily dropped into a, a frame, so to speak. It's in the framework of a shirt, like in terms of like, what, 14 by 17 or whatever it might be. I should know that by now. Um, <laughs> but I can't remember. And then screen sizes are different for different printers too, probably. But uh, generally speaking, you want a floating piece or something that sits well in, in space. Uh, anyway, if you hit the next slide, Lee, I think I did a little breakdown of the composition for these. So mm -hmm. these are all like slightly different kinds of compositions. And it's just, again, leaning back to, to, to the, some of the grab design skill set, just to think about balance. It doesn't, while these maintain some sense of symmetry, generally speaking, if you look at the skeletal remains piece on the left, the, uh, the skull who's in the foreground or in the center of the piece, I'm sorry, the skeleton that's in the center of the illustration, he's not even looking straight at you. You know, yeah. I could have kept it very centralized, but I chose not to. Uh, it's, you know, kind of pointing, looking downward, because you want a little bit of asymmetry. It doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, and another thing to consider, too, is uh, bands' logos. Uh, like, I did something for a band about a week or two ago where the logo is very square. And usually you want a logo that reads nice and horizontal. Mm -hmm. because the square ones eat up so much real estate on a t-shirt and make they're very difficult to work with. And I had a, a band that whose logo is very like, kind of trapped in like a square shape. So I had to, I had to illustrate, I had to have the bulk of the information sort of at the base of the illustration with like little parts kind of coming up just to kind of house that logo. So on its own, the artwork looks a little weird, but with a logo, it looks fine. Do you know what I mean? So there's just stuff to consider when dealing with it, like a printed product, like a t-shirt, where you're uh, trying to accommodate the, uh, the logo as well. So just keep that in mind, like when you're doing an illustration, you can see in the Banger TV one, I actually incorporated on the right, I actually incorporated their logo into the illustration, just sort of as a yeah. different, different take on it, you know? Uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's, 
my uh, two cents on what makes a solid t-shirt illustration. What about you, Lee? What do you think? A lot of similar points. Um, I have a little slide here in a second. Just kind of going a little bit into these, you know, composition choices too. So if you look at the first one on the left, you have an odd number as well in terms of those kind of focus points that you have here. Mm -hmm. And the direction is all consistent. Uh, I'm just kind of like pointing out some of the things that always intrigue me about your work. And like, that's the reason why beyond just, he's very easy to work with. I think Mark's highly in demand is like, he thinks like a graphic designer and like an illustrator, and he knows when to marry those concepts. And like, that's something that that's very unique to you. I think is that like graphic design knowledge, you know, that's like one area of expertise that you have that I, that I don't, for instance, that I always like look to you and like, and I really admire about your stuff. First. Yeah, I mean, even just looking at um, like page layouts, like two page spreads, one page spreads, you see how there's a design will strike a balance between text and visuals, uh, whether they're vector line work or raster photos. There's sort of a harmony about them where they all come together. And it's, it's I, I've mentioned this before, this sort of analogy about people, how they might load the trunk of a car. You know, some people are really good at utilizing the space of a trunk to get all their luggage in. Some people are horrible at it. They just don't have that spatial awareness. Or like maybe the way somebody sets up their living room, it might be supremely utilitarian and functional, whereas others it might be a disaster or um, problematic. And some people have like a really good sense of that. Some people don't. So I feel like it can be something that's learned. You just have to expose yourself to it and and be able to absorb some of that information about what makes what works well in space. And that's what's happening here with with these these compositions. I'm just trying to figure out well, how do I manage this area? I'm always limited to sort of like this sort of rectangular rectangular area. Oh, and then there's a logo that I have to consider. So it's just like with movie pay, with movie posters. We've talked about this in the past in some of our panels. Like, oh, the artist looks like they specifically left an open area for the logo of the film to to reside. You know, so just making these considerations when when taking on a commission certainly will help steer it in the right direction. Definitely. My points are very similar. It has impact up close and at a distance. Yeah. Consistent look with the illustration and the logo. You do an excellent job at that. And then my little slide things kind of in the way, what does it say? Good negative space. You know, it's just, and that's part of the readability from a distance is like, don't yeah. be afraid for like just big pockets of, black t-shirt you know to kind of bleed through because usually we're working with black t-shirts yeah um and some there was like a thing i was like kind of rattling off of my head and i was thinking about this too is like simplicity within complexity and complexity within simplicity so what i mean by that is to create a simple straightforward catchy song in a lot of ways is more difficult than a very technical song right? To have something that's very like uh, iconic. The same goes for like a visual image. So when you're drawn and, and you, you are sketching or something, and then you're adding in these elements and you're like, wait, is that actually necessary? Maybe I should cut that out. Usually when I make that determination to omit something, it's, it's better. So yeah. like, for instance, with the dragon drawing, I originally was going to have this weird, like, alien wart on the planet like a little wart thing and i was like you know what this actually is kind of confusing because now that's just adding an unnecessary detail that's making it like okay is this figure in the foreground in front of it or behind it and it's like just f it just just cut it completely yeah. and you don't even have that problem anymore yeah it's about showing that like an ounce of restraint yeah, yeah you don't want to confuse it um just like kind of was talking about earlier with the that insanity alert album cover like you don't want to you want to look too too much in it um, and granted, it's an album cover. Fine, there's more real estate for that sort of thing. But even even just thinking about like little simple go-to things for T-shirt illustration, you can trap everything in a circle and then break the frame a little bit. If you actually see yeah. Tyler, uh, his crew of six feet, do, do this a lot, where yep. he considers how he frames the illustrations. So you, if you look at a lot of his work, he's got a framed in, in somehow, whether it's a square, rectangle, triangle, circle, but then you see these little bits and pieces that kind of come out the sides, uh, off the edges or around from behind. And all that adds some sense of dynamicism to a piece. So you're not just looking at a very sterile shape. 
you know, you, you want to take that shape and then make it organic. And I feel like that's something I lean on a lot with my own work. Yep. And it's a little bit of advice I feel like could hopefully help other artists who might be struggling in this area when trying to determine how to work in a t-shirt print uh, real estate or canvas area. Just yeah. think simple shapes and then modify it slightly. Yeah. Shapes is is key. Like to me, shapes almost are more important than subjects. Oh, in a oh lot absolutely. Of ways, you know what I mean? It is. It's the bones of the piece, you know? Yeah. And yeah, uh, feel free, Gene Mutation, you can ask any questions here. Um, basically, we're doing ones in the chat, and then there's some predetermined uh, questions as well. But I'm keeping an eye. I'm going to be adding in questions. So if you got anything, feel free to fire away. All right. Next one. Okay, so this one uh, I recall specifically came from uh, Kevin. He goes by Nameless Mist on oh, yeah. Instagram. Oh, yeah, I see Nameless Mist all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really supportive <laughs> dude. Or, yeah. Or, um, yeah. So you got a take on this one. I have a different take on this one because um, it's, it's very much like a just a technical, like, personal preference thing. But Yeah, I, I get it. Um, you, you can go to the next slide. I just – so – I, I have had the problem where the jelly roll will turn out gray or really watery on some when I after I put down some black, but that's usually, I think, depending on what kind of paper type I'm working on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've depicted here in this slide the exact product that I'm using right now. <laughs> the paper image drive. <laughs> Little plug for HP papers here because they need more money. <laughs> It's dude, it's like super shitty 20 pound paper, right? Which yeah. is like not great. It's not even like 70 pound or anything like that. It's not even a cover stock. It's 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 like the shit you see in a crappy fanzine, right? Yeah. Um so this is what I'm using, and it soaks up that sharpie real nice. Sometimes I'll do usually two layers of sharp because you know I'm trying to get rid of streaking is okay like i'm okay with some streaking with the, the black marker but if i want a slightly richer marker you know uh, look i'll just go over it again and i'll use these thicker chisel tip and the magnum sharpies to get like to fill in the broad areas i've i've done a little snippet from a, a piece i did for ingested from the uk um on here just to show like there's a lot of jelly roll activity happening on that little sliver and i left some of the um the marker streaks, I don't know if you can see them on here, but depending on the contrast of your monitor, but I left some of the marker streaks on here so you can kind of see what the artwork looks like in the raw, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, the white actually, the white jelly roll sits really well on this. Like I never have a problem. It's usually pretty, um, pretty opaque uh, for the most part. It doesn't get super watery. I do get a little bit of the, um, I think the part of the original question mentioned something about like some caking on the tip of the pen. Yeah. And that, that's happened with some of them. I'll usually just get my, my fingertip and just like literally just pull on the tip a yeah. little bit. Didn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> to, um, to clean it, you know? And, um, and that's enough. Like that's all I do. If they get too gunky, then I'll just toss them and get a new one. But right now I'm working with, um, 05s, 08s, and 10s. So the okay. 05 gets like a really fine uh, hit, and the 010, if I want to get like a little uh, gunkier and chunkier with some of the um, the phlegm shit that I draw. But um, but this is essentially what I'm using. What you see on the screen here is exactly what I'm using right now, in addition to like Micron uh, pens and uh, Sakura brush pens. Nice. So I haven't had too much of that problem that you're describing with the with I think a lot of it's the the paper because yeah, I, I I I at, on Bristol board yeah. have that issue all the time. Yeah, I will say anytime I'm working on anything, I always have just right next to me. It could be any type of paper because it's just junk. Um, I have something like this. Yeah, I'll just go solo. This is not art, by the way. You just got a piece of paper where you're 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 hitting the pen and making sure that you have the right um, line weight. And then the same with the white pen. Like if it gets gunky, I'll just scratch it off on this. Like I even have like ink streaks. Like all these things are just next to my paper. I'll I'll hit it so I know where my. So for instance, like that's not ink, man. That's pubic hair. 
Of course. <laughs> but like I have, uh, so these are great um, brush pens, but this brush pen is starting to run out. But what it does is it has a nice dry brush feel. So I taped it. So I know this is my weaker one. Oh, yes. If I want to have that effect. And then this is my good one. So at any point in time, I'll have these like broken down pens, which can have a lighter feel. And mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about, um, you Stress. know, the strength of the line and stuff. And then for ones that I need, like a really tight line, I'll have fresh ones. Because like <coughs> micron nibs, they go out. <clears throat> So sorry. Um, but yeah, at any point in time, I always have these to rub things out when it gets gunky. So <clears throat> what you laughing about, man? <laughs> you said rub out. Oh, oh no, that, yeah. Like, that sounds like a Brad Moore tip, man. Am I right? Is that like something? Because I remember vaguely Brad Moore mentioned something like some of his brushes would get so jacked up. He'll just put them in this jar. And just, yeah, yeah, similar. Yeah. I that's, mean, it's just, it, I don't know. That's smart of you to label because I, I do the same thing with my Micron, for example. Yeah, because sometimes like, you want a weak one. Yeah, you want like a gray almost look to something because you, then you get that crappy little scratchy dry one. But I don't exactly. I don't mark them up. I think maybe, I think one of them I, at one point I, I put like a Sharpie line on it or something just to yeah. indicate like, hey, this is your, your pen that's jacked up, you know. Um, but that's cool. I didn't ever thought to put like, you know, the painter's tape on it or something to help distinguish. But yeah, I think those half dead tools are almost equally as handy as the the ones that are are fresh right off the market, you know. For sure, yeah. Uh, so here's my advice for the jelly roll issue that Kevin's having: is don't use a jelly roll and use the Posca white paint pen. I'm telling you. So this I thing is superior. Go ahead. I saw that at this yeah. store and I, I was like oh man that's what lee's using and, and uh i think saw blade or somebody recommended it i know you did and somebody else i thought um uh, uh jerry wormwalk uses it oh jerry okay so i i was looking all i could find was that like it's kind of a thick oh what's up broy <laughs> i'm going to go back and watch your uh your uh, death metal demo tape thing that was live I think this happened last time you were on. All of a sudden, Roy came over and like 10 more people popped in the chat. That's so funny. thank you, Roy. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's cool, man. We were just talking about you earlier. Um, yeah, you got to get the small nib. Uh, I mean, I just bought off Amazon, but I got a pretty tight nib. It's all in Japanese, man. So Japanese I mean, make the best art tools, in my opinion. Show me the tight. What Do you have one of the thin nib ones? Is that what you're this is? On? This is the thinnest I have. and. Yeah. I mean, it works for me. Blow, blow yourself up really quick. I want to see what that looks like. Sure. Um, I, I need to track one of those down because I know you guys keep recommending it. I mean, <laughs> it's pretty tight. You have to be very <laughs> gentle with it. Mm. But like, you know, I'm just doing a stipple, right? So I'm just trying yeah. to get one little dot. And for, I mean, I have your originals here. I know what scale you work yeah. at. It'll work. Okay. Does it wear down the nib on it? Does it get like flat after a while? Like, Because I, I, I have a uh, No, because it's... I don't have that issue. You just have to make sure that, um, so if you put down a lot, it will get cakey. So that's why I was talking earlier about having like a scratch pad for, you know, whatever. Is it like one of those pens where you, you have to push down on the nib to get the paint to yeah. kind of come down to the, to the front of it? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, cool. I, I've found that it's the best. And it, here's the other thing. If you want it to have that weaker gray, what you do is you'll do a little stipple, right? Yeah. Wait two seconds, get your finger, dab it, lift up, lift up. And oh. what you're doing is you're lifting the paint off so then it's not this super bright white. It's like a slightly duller white. So I'll do it all the time, and you can't even tell that I'm doing any. Now, big whiteout areas, that's a whole different thing. But for little touch-ups, like I do it all over my pieces. Yes, on Bristol. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Thanks to you, man. Got Have you used it at all? I haven't used it yet. I'm waiting for one of our next collabs to to pop that on. You know. Yeah, we gotta yeah, we gotta do something again. That was so I'm gonna fun. have to use your your supply list when we when we do one of these again, man. I'll tell you, I think I th the thing is you working on like that thin paper. I don't know yeah. how well the paint pen will do, but if you're using Bristol, like yeah, first everyone time. else, <laughs> so yeah. Kevin, I'm telling you, I mean, Mark knows his shit, but I in this case. I would listen to me. Yes. Just I in do. this one example. No, it's true. I mean, when you look at the longevity of your work too, 
if you're concerned about archival type quality, you want to yeah. use that stuff. The stuff I'm using is is trash, but I'm okay with using trash because it's it's how I did it when I was a teenager. It's how I'm going to do it now. You know, I just yeah. there's something about that connection to the old school death metal underground way of doing things that I, I just can't let go of. You know what I mean? It keeps me grounded. It keeps me, keeps me humble in a way, like just to use these, these materials that aren't, you know, I'm still, I graduated to microns, I graduated secure brush, stuff like that. But there's still, you know, something about picking up a Sharpie, something about picking up some crappy paper, you know, and being able to draw on it. But, um, Bristol board I'm okay with, like, I think I've, I think I've drawn on it in the past. Uh, it's just not like a go-to thing for me. But um, yeah. I definitely want to give this a shot, and maybe next time we do our um, like a maybe an exquisite corpse or whatever kind of uh, collab. I'm mean, I'm not going to use it for like stupid sketches or anything because I don't want to waste it. But um, for a finished piece, yeah, man. Yeah, totally. No, that was a good question. I, I I nerd out about the technical details, as you guys know, which is great. Somebody somebody has to. <laughs> I love that <laughs> stuff. All right, so here's a, a heavier question. So can you make a living with your art? Let's just talk generally. And what are the pros and cons to having art as a full-time career versus a side hobby? Big question. I'll let you take the floor. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of questions from some folks that have committed some earlier. And I try to, this is by no means exhaustive. I have not thought too deeply about this concern. Um, but I wanted it and I'm probably not the best person to ask, but I'll give you my vantage point on it. Just generally speaking, uh, my answer is it depends on who you are, not only as an artist, but as an individual, as a person, uh, what are your obligations? Do you have loved ones that you care for who are, you, you are obligated to, to support, you know, there is a lot of, um, out, outside factors that can contribute to your decision making about whether to be a full time artist or a part time artist, so to speak. And my answer is yes, you could be either one, but it's a choice, it's a very personal choice. And I just try to kind of generalize some some aspects of what both might look like. So let's say you're going to be a full time artist. I, I just jotted down a couple of pros here. You have a genuine fulfillment of being a creative person. Uh, when I look at somebody like Skinner, who you interviewed, yeah. um, you know, and Jerry, I mean, Jerry works full time and he does his work part time. My understanding is Skinner. Full time. Yes, full time artist. So you see like this, this dude who is genuine, just genuinely a creative entity, creative force. That's what he lives and breathes. Not to say that Jerry doesn't, or I don't like, I, I, cause I'm a part time artist too. I have a full time day job. Uh, so just to, to be able to live and breathe, that is amazing. Much respect to anybody who chooses to take that, that path. Uh, you can determine your own worth of time and you have to, because that's your career. That's your job now is to be a solely independent, creative person. So you're determining how much you're worth and what people are going to pay for you for your service. Uh, you're also going to have increased output, which is great because now you have um, your tentacles, so to speak, in so many different areas because you're constantly being creative, nonstop, 24-7, right? That's your, that's what you do. Uh, the, the cons, and, and, and from my vantage point, would be, you know, you're dependent on that sole income. Like, uh, you know, you're dependent on making a living from this. So you're going to have to consider, like, the business aspect, uh, you know, how you – how you balance your time versus your, like your mental health and well-being. Um, are you going to insure your, you have, you know, pay, buy insurance plan and stuff like there's a lot to think about uh, when you're doing it on your own, because your health is important too. You, you're probably going to want to have health insurance. If you're paying out of pocket, you're going to have to have some kind of job to, to pay for that, you know, some kind of commission um, just to cover that or cover your mortgage or your rent, whatever your situation is. So there's that reckoning of with unpredictability, so unless you have some like consistent, constant clientele, you run the, that risk of not knowing whether or not you can pay your mortgage or your rent that month. Uh, so there's a, inherently a greater level of risk taking. And I kind of mean that twofold. I kind of mean that in a con and as a pro. Con in that you're taking a risk on 
your livelihood, your ability to put food on, on a plate for yourself or for your family. Uh, because there's sometimes a level of unpredictability when you're a freelance artist, I mean, full-time freelance artist. Uh, but there's also greater risk taking in that, like, uh, in, in, as a pro in the sense that um, you're having to think outside of the box. You're having to take risks and take on commissions that uh, might be a little bit out of your wheelhouse just, just to, like, have the, um, the income. So that's my vantage point in that I'm sure somebody like Skinner, for example, could probably paint a way more clear picture of that because that's what he does and that's what he knows. That's what he lives and breeds. Um, so I'm, I'm just giving you like bare bones, my perspective on it. On the other side of the coin, if you're a part-time artist, meaning you have a full-time career or a part-time career somewhere else, um, I'll take like Fred from Form Terror Growth, for example, he works part-time. And then another the half this time is spent illustrating. He's a good example. Of somebody's truly half and half. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, you still get the genuine fulfillment of being a creative person. It's just not constant throughout your day. Um, I guess you might have other distractions if you're at a, a day job. Uh, you're also one of the pros is that you're not totally dependent on your art income because you already have a job. You already have you know health insurance or whatever you know a retirement plan. Uh, that you're 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 saving for, uh, so you can have some stability in your old age. Um, you can also feel like pick and choose your job requests at your own liberty because I feel like if you're if you're full time, it, unless you're really well established, um, it, you might have a, you can probably be pickier and choosier. But if you're just kind of getting your feet on the ground, you might have to take a job you you know you don't like um, just to make the money or pay a bill or whatever. Whereas if you're you know already in, gainfully employed elsewhere, you can kind of pick and choose your clients. You know, you don't have to take something that's going to give you a headache because you don't need the money. Um, the only con I can see is like creative burnout. Like if you have a creative day job uh, and then you have to be creative when you come home, you could you could probably potentially run into creative burnout where you're, maybe you're overdoing it, overdoing yourself. You could probably run into that too if you're a full-time artist, but my hunch is that you're probably more likely if you have a day job where you're dealing with the traffic, commute, all that stuff. Um, it's also a limited time frame to complete art requests. I feel like you're doing this half time. Uh, you know, if you have a pressing deadline, you might have to make some accommodations with your day job, like take a day off or whatever to catch up on a freelance gig or whatever. Um, there's also the inability to exercise full creative autonomy as a part time creative person uh, or part time artist. That mean, meaning like you're not living necessarily like living and breathing it every second of your day. Uh, and this is, again, just very general and I'm by no means an expert on any of this, but this is just from my vantage point, thinking about it kind of loosely. Do you have any, any feedback on that, Lee? Because I know you're kind of in a similar boat. Where yeah, you're... I have a very similar perspective. Um, there wasn't a second slide for this question, was there? Yeah, there's a couple more slides. I just wanted to talk about. But um, yeah, I'll, I can go if you want. Um, yeah, please. I mean, I think very similar things. So, uh, typically people who ask this type of question, it's from coming from a place of curiosity. This is all my personal perspective and advice, not that anyone should take it as fact, just to put it out there, because this is the type of thing where it is so dependent on the individual and, how art sits in your life right so me and you i could say if we say are both obsessed with art and we love it right mm -hmm. but there's other things in our life that we also love and when you make it full time there's so many things you have to sacrifice and you wonder sometimes or at least i do if it's truly worth it you know like it's it's probably pretty difficult to have like a family or go on vacation and stuff like that. If you're doing it full time, it just is, it's difficult. Not that it's not possible, but it makes it harder. So life is more than just art, even if we're obsessed with it. I also think that in my case, and for a lot of people who love art, it's get undeniably good first, then figure out if you want to go full time or not. Like, you could want maybe to be full time eventually, but like to me, if I was thinking like of art goals, 
going full time art, given the experience I've had, would not be one of my goals. It would be the result of getting really, really good at the craft. And then maybe I have the opportunity to go full time. So be wary of maybe the goals that you set for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like to me, the goals, yes, getting commissions and sometimes the outcomes of things are important and they're milestones, but goals in a lot of cases should be things that you have almost complete control over how many hours you're putting in a week, different skills you're trying to work on. So kind of things like that. Like, I just think you got to be kind of wary of like what you're setting your beacon of success as, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's self-defined. What yeah. defines success? I mean, you, you do, there's no, there's no clear cut definition of what that is. It's what it is for yourself. Yeah. And that's like, it. sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's just, you know, one thing I've learned a lot through doing this podcast and anyone who's watched along, you know, you guys are finding out information at the same pace as me. A lot of the artists that are in this scene that you hold on a pedestal and you think are really successful, a lot of them have full-time or part-time jobs outside of this, just like bands. Yeah. Not many bands do it full-time either in metal. And like, it's just kind of part of the reality and like, I've accepted it and I've actually found that it takes a lot of the pressure off and allows me to be more creative. So for me, I actually kind of like the balance I have now with having a full-time job, a full-time job that I don't hate. That's another thing too. The people that like, it's like art or nothing. That's not, that's not how I am because I, I can find other things interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I agree 100% with that. but the people that are art or nothing, they're more likely to take those risks and go full time and maybe yeah. they'll be successful or, or maybe they won't. I hope they are, but yeah, yeah. it, uh, it is difficult. And, uh, there are others, th the whole like starving artist or tortured artist thing. It's, it's overplayed, man. <laughs> like you can be happy and normal and well-adjusted and yeah. create good work. I firmly believe that. So, oh, I firmly believe that as well. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess, yeah, just don't hang your hat on the only thing. Uh, you're like a failure if you're not full time because so right. many people aren't. It, 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 it's not the end of the world. So that's just my two cents on it. Absolutely. So if you go to the next slide, Lee, um, I have a couple of the qualities I think that might play a role in decision making when it comes to going full time or part time. So I looking at personal attributes, who you are as a person plays a lot, uh, plays a huge role in how you're going to be, act when it comes to being a creative person. So I think that first and foremost, you have to question, are you passionate? Is this something that you care about? So just to gauge your passion level. And to be honest with yourself about it, um, for me, I think that's the core of defining core of what the core that defines whether or not you are going to be an artist is whether or not you're passionate about art, the arts, and being a creative person. That's going to be the ultimate motivator and driver of everything that you do is your your passion. That means your love for what you do. Uh, the next thing is. I think you have to be a creative problem solver. I think creativity is inherently a problem solving activity. You have to be self-motivated because jobs don't get done unless you make the time and effort for them. Uh, you know, you can sit on something or like, I know artists have a big problem. I think I've spoken on this before, like where they can't decide when a piece is finished. You have to know when you reach the finish line with each piece so that you can move on to the next. You have to be self-motivated because otherwise your client's not going to get the finished product unless you put the pen to the paper or the brush to the canvas. Uh, I think exercising humility is huge. Uh, that means accepting criticism from not just a customer, but also from your peers and to, um, to know that it's usually good willed criticism and it has to be useful and helpful criticism and to not only hear it, but in some cases apply it too. Uh, perseverance is another important quality. If you decide you want a career in art, so to speak, um, perseverance means that your willingness to work with a 
a customer on maybe a, a problem you might run into and finding sort of that compromise where you're not sacrificing your, your brand as an artist, but also taking into consideration what your customer's needs are. So finding that balance and also being able to, uh, being able to overcome problems like artist block, learning like little techniques and ways to kind of get around that. Uh, and I mentioned again, compromise, um, cause what we do, there is an aspect of it that is very much customer service based. We're in the business of commercial arts to some degree. And that means working with the customer, uh, and being able to, um, deliver finished product to them. And I think last thing to, to consider, uh, it would be just thinking ahead, planning ahead, being a visionary. Uh, knowing what your next step will be if you want to continue on this path, sort of having a little bit of foresight to determine like what you want to do next or what your goal might be set, what's the goal you might set for the, the following year or the following month or whatever it might be. So I think those are important personal attributes to consider about yourself if you're going to be an artist. Uh, the next slide, Lee. Absolutely. Of, yeah, so in terms of like making a living as an artist or trying to uh, get get paid or some kind of compensation for your work. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. I'm just giving you from my own experience and from talking to friends of mine who are creative or in the creative industry. Um, artists work differently. Some do flat rate. Some do value and use, meaning like, let's say I'm going to do a shirt for a concert or, you know, a festival. Well, maybe, maybe you get um, maybe charge a little bit more money for that because it's higher visibility, higher product yield. Uh, also considering the scope of the project, is it being used on one thing? Is it being used on 10 things? Do you want to be compensated for all 10 things that's published on? Uh, another thing to consider is like, are you going to get a cut or percentage of sell of product? Like you work for a big company, maybe you get like 5% of like each product sold, or maybe you get on a retainer for a particular company or brand where they pay you monthly and when they need your service, they hit you up and you do the work for them. And also to consider pro bono on occasion, like doing something as sort of like a voluntary contribution somewhere, because I feel like there's some benefit of that in a way, sort of like self advertising, like you might donate your art to, to a particular cause or a particular thing that you're fond of. And it's, it's not only benefiting somebody else, but it's also benefiting you and that you're also propelling your brand, your visual uh, art brand, so to speak, out to the community. So there's a lot of things to consider. This is just sort of, again, scratching the surface, but I'm by no means an expert on this. this is just, I'm just speaking from experience and the experience of uh, my colleagues who I've spoken with who, who deal with some of this stuff. Yeah, I got just a simple thing to add to is just remember when you are creating an illustration and you're working with a band, you're essentially licensing to them. You still can use that image if you have it in your contract for creating your own prints and selling the original piece to not then be reproduced. So there's three different ways that you can get money in a simple way. There's probably more from even just one drawing. So don't yeah. forget that value. And when you're working with bands, or brands or whatever, be very specific that you can use this license for a t-shirt. If you're gonna use this same drawing for maybe a skateboard, we need to renegotiate. So word your things so that they're fair to you and to the client. That would be another piece of advice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Defiler of the Crown is asking about how to overcome artist block. I, I've spoken on this, I think in the past, um, maybe it was, an interview we, we had Lee at some point, or maybe it was yeah, one of the yeah. panel discussions. Um, I, I'll give an example. I just one one thing I had done recently, which is kind of a little strange, but I I actually took some of my old pieces and collaged them to some degree, like little bits and and pieces from some older illustrations, put them together on a paper, and then just like added added new elements to it made a new piece essentially from like essentially like Frankenstein, you know, and, and some older art into something new and like use it as um, uh, like a Riddick, Riddick art merch, you know, uh, just to just to try something a little bit different. So if you're kind of feeling stale, maybe that's one way to to attack uh, an artist block is just to like look at some of your old stuff. Another thing I'll do is just go through 
uh, old sketches stuff or unfinished pieces that I thought may have may, may not have made the cut, you know, two or three years ago. But when I look at it again with fresh set of eyes, I can see the potential in it. And sometimes that sparks ideas. Sometimes just sketching, you know, or maybe like stepping outside your, your comfort zone and trying to sketch something different uh, or unusual that you might not normally uh, approach it can, can spark some new ideas. Those are just a few tips, but uh, there's probably some other exercises that would be fun to like go over and maybe in a session sometime Lee, where we can just talk strictly about artist block and maybe some techniques to get around it. I think that'd be fun. You know, a little bit show and tell, you know. I'm just trying to like, I, I, and this is not like me trying to be, I'm not trying to say anything here. Just like I have a lot of problems in art but art block isn't one I really have experienced that much. Like for me, I, I don't under, I don't fully understand the concept because I always have, I have right now about 15 pieces that I wish I had the time to draw and I have them written out here. So it's not, uh, I guess if, if I was given a creative problem from a client and I didn't know how to solve it, if that's the definition of artist block, I can relate to that, but not knowing what to draw at any point in time, that's harder for me to relate to, but wait till you've been drawing for 30 years. <laughs> I guess that, yeah, you don't want to repeat yourself too much. Every once in a while you'll get it. I mean, I, it doesn't happen to me frequently at all either. Part of that, what I just described, like because sampling bits and pieces of older illustrations to me was also like a, an exercise in creativity. See so like, huh, where can I take, cause it made me think of like AI, for example, you know, where it's pulls, pulls and pulls and pulls stuff. Right. But what if I did my own sort of AI thing where I just like grab a couple of things and throw it on paper to build a run? <laughs> you have AI like, yourself. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. More of like, not just necessarily get around a, a, like a problem I was having. I, not, not to say I was necessarily having an artist block, but it was a technique that I thought, oh, this could come in handy if, if I am in this situation where like I don't have a condition, I don't know what to draw. You know, um, but I, I don't usually um, run into that problem. But um, I guess another suggestion, too, would be like think of like some of your favorite albums or bands and like just read some lyrics that might like what if the like hypothetically, what if what if um, like um, Asfix said, uh, draw me um, a T-shirt for the rack and you go, you know, obviously there's some existing art by Axel Harmon, but maybe do your own take on it. Or maybe you read the lyrics and interpret it your own way. Like, how would I visualize this? You know, it's sometimes it's just about like um, taking a little prompt and repurposing it in your own way. Um, so maybe that's a quick tip to to get over a, a hump, like if you don't know what to draw. But um, but usually I, I feel like if, if a band is requesting something or a customer is requesting something, you just like, well, what have they done in the past? Or what what does the other stuff look like? Like Liquid Death, for example, like you look at what they do. It's a hodgepodge of just different styles, but it's all kind of themed around water somehow. Water product, product, that's their product, that's their line, that's what they're selling. So you got to include that somehow into like the illustration. You know what I mean? Just yeah. stuff like that. If you, it, so let me, let me give a better answer than, you know, what I did. So if it's, if it's a problem from a client and I don't have the right mindset to uh, fix it at this point in time, or I, I don't have the vision, I go on a run. And then while I'm running, while I'm getting closer to runner's high, I would start playing out different scenarios and, and kind of like doing a little visual slide deck in my head while I'm running. Cause I can get in the zone. So exercise would be one thing, uh, sleep on it and then put it aside start drawing something from reality um, or just do some kind of sketching practice, draw shapes on a page. Yep. I would do things like that. And then if I didn't know what to draw, I would see how much time I had. And then based on how much time I had would be how I would basically utilize it. So if I only have 10 minutes, for instance, then doing something gestural, maybe even doing a master study, like a really quick one, because I, I'm a firm believer in that. I know some people don't get that as much with like studying from old masters, but that's a big part of how I have gotten better at least. Yeah, I've, um, I've noticed that too. Like you actually, because you have all these sketchbooks with these studies, Yeah, like the amount of stuff that you've absorbed is unreal. And also that's information that can then spark new ideas. Totally. You know, you're probably not at a loss for... <laughs> 
That's why you haven't had artist block yet. You draw so damn much, which is great. That's a great thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I don't, and then uh, there's a lot of things I just I just start putting like doodling, man. Doodling means not thinking and just drawing. Like doodling is instinctual, and if you want it to feel like a true doodle, get out you know, like a notebook, if you're, you know, the, from like your high school days or whatever, like that kind of thing. And then a ballpoint pen and like ruled paper. And it doesn't feel like art anymore. It just feels like doodle. And you're just practicing, you know, like you're practicing unconsciously, um, which doesn't, uh, it's not an excuse for doing consistent intentional practice, but it's better than nothing. Right. So I don't know. I don't know if that's helpful, but I think it is. Yeah, that's that's how I would approach it. And and never be afraid to just step away from a piece and exercise or watch a movie or 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 just completely separate it because the the way the mind works is why do why do people get so many good ideas or come up with uh, you know ideas when they're in the shower? It's because they're not thinking. I need to get an idea. They're just existing. You know what I mean? That's, so like right. there's studies on this stuff. So put yourself in that type of mindset by actually not creating if if you're feeling completely burnt out on it. Excellent advice. There was a question from Gaz earlier too. I'm going to pull up and then we'll do the slide deck again. A lot of good questions. Thank you guys in the chat. So gene mutation. Tips on keeping rendering consistent. Maybe mindset or a warm up technique. I find myself getting hung up on overworking one area, trying to get it right and know when it's versus efficient. Oh, well, I can relate to that struggle. What do you got, Mark? I'll let you speak on this one. Okay. So I think part of what you're saying here is my approach where, so here, let me give you an example. So, and I'll bring this one up again. There's this piece right now I'm working on and it's, pretty technically challenging for me. So if you look at it, I haven't finished everything, but what I did was I built up the values in these this area here. So this was very difficult to get, sorry, the mirror is fucking with me, to get the light passing through the trees in a very convincing way and have that gradation. But what I did was I had to build up things and there was just a lot of this kind of middle value. And what I did was I built it up, but then I, every once in a while, I needed to go fully to that darkest value. So I knew how to relate it back. So I would do a little bit of going around in an area, building up and going darker, then going to a next one and then bouncing around the page a lot. And then eventually, once you figured out your darkest values, it'll start to kind of come together like a puzzle. So completely rendering one area is fine, but make sure you don't do that again. What you do is, okay, this is the established look. Now I need to put everything in kind of a wash state where nothing's just purely white. And then I can see the puzzle kind of start to form. So that would be my advice, if that makes sense. It does. It's funny because hearing you speak about it, I, I don't, to me, it's so still, because I already kind of have like an idea of my process, right? I already, I don't have to think about what I'm doing. I just do it. Yeah. Hey, I just, you know, filling in, but, but with hearing you say it makes me think, okay, I do make, I do do this. I just don't really pay too, too close attention. Like just intuition, second nature, if you will. Oh, uh, you know, hit with the, the, the solid blacks, just spread the blacks out wherever. Yeah. I need to on the page to get like the the darkest point of contrast and then build around and I'm not I'm not really focused on one specific area all the time. I'm kind of all over the place. Or I'm yeah. just moving along like almost like like a just from one one corner to the next. You know, it's just I'm not I'm not real like focused on one specific area when I when I illustrate. I'm kind of all over the map. Um, if I recall correctly, um, because I, I get so lost when I'm doing it and really think about what I'm doing. Uh, but that that's an interesting question. I feel like once you kind of have your own style too, and you know how to attack each piece because you know the techniques you're going to lean on to to achieve a finished product, um, yeah. you have your sort of like your toolkit, so to speak, that you always kind of 
depend on for each piece that that's looking amazing by the way dude that it, it, it kind of reminds me of some of the stuff um daniel shaw sawblade has yeah. done in the past of his stippling work where he does sort of like these ghostly ghastly kind of creatures and forms and and just does it all in stipple and i know you haven't necessarily used stipple here but it has a true sense of uh light gleaming through the trees that's hard to capture. It's really hard to capture. <laughs> that was very yeah. difficult. Yes. So that's, that's like, I, I assume that maybe you're you're pulling out that that one of those those uh blue tape uh pens that's kind of like half yeah. dead to capture some of those like I even used a little bit of a white pencil near the base of the yeah. trees to have a fog layer. Yeah, very that's... little bit. Dude, that, that thing it's crazy how good that's looking. It just it it like again, when I think like if you handed me your raw sketch and said Mark ink this, it would look totally different from what you're doing, and it would not be as good as what you're doing. Dude. But it's a whole different style. Yeah, like because because the way I think about it, and the thing is, you you think so much better for reproduction. I still am having trouble doing that because oh, I can't man. I can't resist myself. Yeah, you shouldn't though. That's but I like to I like to paint with a pen. Yeah, like the I, Franklin Booth bernie wrightson type technique that's yeah. what i like to do and that's yeah. kind of my skill set but your yeah. style you keep the whites you know a lot better you know it's kind of, mine's kind of like chunky and clunkier i guess like I, when i look at that the piece that you did there's a lot of finesse in your ink work and a lot of true like almost gray even though it's probably not gray it's black and white but it looks gray because of yeah. the way you've hit the paper it just dude it's so phenomenally executed great composition too by the way on that piece and the, the, it's just the like light source is something I never think about, never consider. I don't challenge myself with that. But you clearly thought a lot about it. And I know like Tyler, maybe some of his influence came into there too, because I know that's a thing for him uh, when working. But you I draw I can, from similar people. Yeah, know? yeah, absolutely. I can see that. But two different, completely different styles. But um, the the attention, the the lighting in, in in that new piece you're working on is really impressive. Thanks, really man. Lovely, dude. Yeah, I hope my insight was helpful there, Gene. Because, like, I think I, I don't completely discourage fully rendering one area because now you've established the look. It's just not getting fixated on that. So I hate, I hope I'm not being too repetitive. But, um, and I also look at your work quite often because uh, it comes up on my feed and I don't feel like you overwork it ever personally. So, it, it, so people could look at my stuff and be like, oh, you're overworking it. But, that's kind of my style. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. One other question it was a lot earlier. I hope you're still here. Gas. I think he's in New Zealand. So I don't know what the time oh. is. Uh, brutal whimsy here. So yeah. So when you were talking about compositions, like are you making that decision pretty much immediately? And are you mapping those little like arrows out? Or are you just kind of know in between the lines, basically what you're going for? Um, sometimes I, I am, but um I think a lot of it's driven by the content. Like, what am I, what am I drawing? What, so I think what I'm drawing, like whatever the subject matter is, is going to help dictate the, um, the composition, like what composition I decide on. Like if I feel like something's too ambiguous looking uh, and it's not really well contained, I have to create a container for it. And so that means like, Oh, even though, it's floating in space. I might actually go in and put like a rectangle frame on it or something that infers a rectangle frame to help kind of close it in because I feel like it's too, it's too loose or too, um, a little too organic. Yeah. It, needs to, it needs to have some structure. So it's finding these sort of building blocks based on like what the content is. Um, it, it just i think it like like today i had a sketch of like a like a skeleton warrior for this album cover for um an american band and um a customer i've worked with in the past and i was like okay that's really straightforward but then i built a couple things around it to kind of help you know the composition is kind of diagonal like that's an easy go-to thing so i need something to kind of counterbalance that try that diagonal composition a little bit and then maybe something over here to help ground it you know so it's like it's like even though I had the main subject in place and it could just live on its own and be fine, I added a few things to help kind of anchor it and help build the composition out. So those are like, again, grab design choices where 
I'm like, yeah, I have this diagonal shape, but I can put like a uh, like a rectangle here or a rectangle here to help kind of you know contain it, so to speak, like I mentioned earlier. So a lot of it's just driven by the subject matter. It's not like I go and saying, oh, I'm going to make a triangle composition or I'm going to just going to do something that's a circle. No, it just it depends on what what the what's being asked of me. Um, it, it gets harder when there's more um, parts and pieces, like how I talked about earlier in, in, the, in the conversation about overdoing something. Now I have, what, 10, 12 different moving parts and pieces I got to manage and squeeze into this little area. So that's going to overcomplicate, like, how I set my composition. So, like, then a sanity alert cover, for example. I just did the, the three-quarters full um, composition where you have – this much fills the space and I have a dark piece up here to kind of counter it. It's just, it's a simple grab design choice and all the shit lives inside of it. You know yeah. what I mean? I have these containers that I've created. So a lot of it's just about trying to simplify um, if you can, if like you have too much thrown at you. But I, again, it's all content driven. Like what's the task? What's being asked of me? What do they want? What does the customer want me to draw? And then figuring out like how to strike that balance um, during the sketch process. Um, just kind of talking about thumbnails a little bit too. There's, there's two right reasons why thumbnail sketches are, are tiny. One of them is it doesn't take as much time. The second is if you can figure out what you're looking at and it's that tiny, it has graphic power. So that step, which takes oftentimes 10 minutes, or it could take a long time depending on, hey, let me, let me put it back up here. Show it. Just showing some shit like little, yeah. Like, and then you know, well, how do I show it as a composition? You know what I mean? Like, the step's incredibly like, important. Foreground, uh, middle ground, background. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and those are just really. I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong button. I just removed you for a second. I'm sorry. I just happen to have those sitting here. So. Well, I have. Uh... And the thing is, they don't show up well. But here's my final sketch for the piece that I just worked on. You can see I even made some changes. But I was like, I want a frame, a frame, a frame, and then this. But even then, it's just blobs. You know what yeah. I mean? And I didn't have that kind of cool organic frame shape yet. So, And, and a lot of it, written notes, man. Written yeah. notes are very helpful. I use them all the time. Yeah, I think, dude, that's a great way to, speaking of composition, like that's a great way to be preliminarily mapping it out. Essentially, that's what you're doing. You're in that problem-solving process. Exactly. That creative process of problem-solving. Here's what's been handed to me. How do I make it work? How do I make it all work together? Oh, and there's a logo. How do I make that logo work with it? You know, there's a, lot to, a couple things to think about, but it's just you get real good at it the more you do it. Yeah. In terms of when you're doing your drawing stuff, like so the banger one, right? Uh, where you had part of the bottom of the logo actually like a drawn kind of, uh, you know, yeah. fleshy kind of stuff, right? Yeah, too, yeah. Did you like print out the logo and then draw over it? Like, how do you remember yeah. doing that and if blending I recall, it? If I recall correctly, I took my sketch, scanned it in, took the banger TV logo sketch, created an outline of it. So I'm just like using the stroked outline of the logo and did a blue line of that, printed out the blue line. So yeah. now I have a sketch with the logo coupled together and just inked on top of the blue line print out. I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure that's how I did it. Yeah. It's been a while. That's an old one. That's, I don't know, almost 10 years old now, probably. Years old or something. The working with logos, I got to, as I get more experience, I have, I'll be more and more cognizant of that. You know what I mean? I, I've kind of, only kept it as an afterthought and I've gotten lucky so far, but uh, I know eventually it's going to catch up to me, you know? So I need to be out of that. And there, there's a lot of, like, like a lot of the time I find myself, um, I, I, the logo might not work with my style of illustration. So sometimes I'll, I'll take the logo and either not necessarily re it, but I'll do things to it to make it more uh, cohesive with the illustration. So yeah. it all looks like one living entity as opposed to like this got pasted on here. And it's okay. Sometimes like the pasted on here look is okay. But in a lot of cases, I'll like add some some stuff to embellish the logos a little bit to kind of make them 
work better with the art, you know, the illustration. Uh, so that that is certainly something you'll you'll you might run into down the road too. Is like, well, how do I make this match the drawing? Like, do they share some kind of visual harmony somehow? Is there a texture I can add to? Like, it's cool. Sometimes like bands will ask me to illustrate their logo, or like Death Clock. Um, I just did some stuff for Death Clock where I drew their logo, like took their logo, and then did a few things to it to make it still recognizable as them, like their brand and like what they are as a band. But then I'll do some stuff to it to kind of expand on it. So still recognizable, but it's still like slightly my own take on it, you know? You've done quite a bit of that. I think you did that for like Slipknot once too, didn't you? Yeah. Did like a Riddick version of the logo? Yeah, that was, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. With Super 8, probably right, if I remember uh, right. It was um, a Rebel 8 is the name of it. So, Rebel 8, okay. Yeah, Super the, 8's the uh, toy company. Toy it? company, yeah. So uh, Rebel 8's a streetwear brand uh, out of California um yeah yeah it was a collab thing but yeah sometimes that's like a that's more of like a full-on illustration you know what I mean like a real finished okay. illustration because you're essentially taking this letter form sort of the logo is and then filling it in with your own take you know your own stuff that makes you who you are as an artist you know? um, that's a little bit more cumbersome and challenging because that's like really a true illustration it's it takes more time but usually the logos, I'll just like add some drips or some rot and shit on it just to kind of make oh, okay. it. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like, like Revocation, for example. It's funny because some bands will run with it. I think like the Revocation logo was originally um, Horst uh, typography. Um, did, it's a good logo, man. Yeah, it is. It's really good. Uh, Horst uh, did that. Uh, Chris Horst, I think his first name is Chris, uh, did their logo. And. Um, uh, I remember embellishing it once for a t-shirt. I've done a couple of shirts for them since then, but I remember adding some drifts, but now they're like, <laughs> they'll use that version a lot still too. So it's just cool, you know, cause it makes sense with a lot of the other products that they're putting out. Then like a lot of other bands will do that. Once you, you know, embellish the logo, then you might find that a customer might enjoy reusing it down the road. But um, yeah, yeah. So there's that to think about for sure. Sweet. All right, let's keep on with the prepared questions for a bit. All right, favorite part of the process? Yeah, it's straightforward. Speaking of Rebel 8, that's a piece I did for Rebel 8 that was, I think, um, utilized on a blanket, like a giant blanket, like a throw oh, wow. blanket. Um, yeah, inking process. It's just, um, for me, It's that's a, the best part because – that's what well, the sketch is the hard work is already done the sketch is the hard work because you're trying to get the combination right you get it approved by your customer you start inking it the inking process to me is the most meditative yeah of the entire process it requires the least amount of thinking i you know you know my mind is obviously working because i'm making decisions about where the ink goes but it's such like a nature activity for me now that it's no different from like riding a bike or urinating or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a place for me to get lost and escape. It's a form of escapism ultimately, right? Because life is hard. It's, you know, we're, we're humans. It's hard. Life is hard. It's a struggle. And when you can pause and have a moment for, for meditation or um, self-wellness, take advantage of it for me like you know having wife and kids it's my moments are they're like 10 15 minute increments you know what i mean so because i'm always getting up and making dinner i gotta sit down or you know like oh, somebody's getting into something you know there's just stuff there's distractions in life so for, even if i can squeeze in like you know 10 minutes just to ink it's it's a great uh reset for me kind of like how you mentioned you go for a run or whatever yeah to to find that moment of of of, of uh, introspection for me it's inking and being an introvert that's huge for me because it's a way for me to re-energize so to speak you know i, I know i keep saying that um but it's it's, <laughs> it's all <laughs> you, good there are other folks that you get stuck on that's my yeah point. yeah um but i i think that the the sense of introspection is really uh essential to 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 me as an introvert because it helps me recharge and and um be able to be more productive so you know in the past 
you know, before kids, I could spend hours on this, but now like, it's just, it's just life is busy. And so, uh, I, I value any moment I have to, to engage in this, the thinking process. It's the best part. The, for me. It's a flow state. It's when you can really mm-hmm. lose yourself in it. Whereas awesome. you gotta, it's more front of the head thinking when you're drawing and sketching. I, I totally right. agree. It is totally. What, 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 what about you, uh, Lee? What do you find most therapeutic about the, the entire process? So for me, I, I agree. Inking is a lot of fun and, and very relaxing. I put down. Oh, wait. Well, I put it. I, maybe I deleted it because it was just me talking. But the light bulb moments. Yeah. So when you like every stage there's like a light bulb moment when it's like, mm-hmm. I figured out that problem because I, I do see illustration as a series of problems. Perspective is a problem. Lighting and shadow is a problem, not a problem that I don't enjoy, but we're talking about problem solving a lot today. And like, I do think that that component of art is uh, very, very much a, a big piece of it. You it's know. part of the like ninety percent of the process. <laughs> exactly, you have to enjoy creative problem solving. So, yeah. when I like, when I get a thumbnail that I like, that's all. That's a light bulb moment. When I do a loose sketch and I can start to see it come together, light bulb moment. So, like I kept it kind of general in that sense. That that is my favorite part of the process is that moment of it where I, I'm, I'm getting something done. Like yeah. we were talking before air that like, sometimes there's weeks where you're getting a lot of revisions and it feels like you're spinning your wheels. There's not as many light bulb moments there. You know what I mean? But when you do get them, they feel really damn good. Right. So yeah, that's the thing that keeps me going. And it gives me like a little, you know, dopamine hit. So it comes from maybe a little bit more of a place of uh, adrenaline for me at times. I think um, it's funny because I, I, I don't want to say I'm numb to it because I still get that on occasion too, but it is a good feeling. I think uh, Plato called it noose, the noose, the noose feeling, where it's like this aha moment, like you said, the light bulb goes off. It is a highly rewarding experience for sure. Um, I, I guess for me, like I don't get it as often unless – unless I feel like there was a little bit more of a struggle beforehand and then yeah. I finally get it right. Um, like that book cover I mentioned earlier, I, I had the sketch approved and then I used my 13 year old daughter to sort of like my sounding board or my, my, yeah. my we got to have that person. Yeah. Cause she, she'll look at it and tell me what she see. Like I, I do that a lot with my work is I'll be like, what do you see? What is this? I'll be like, I sure of something that I've started. Like, what is this? And she'll, if she can get it right, if she can tell me the story I'm trying to put the message I'm trying to execute here, then if she gets it. Then I'm like, okay, it's good. It's good to go. It's good to keep going. So I, I showed it to her as I, I start barely started inking it. And there was part of it that she was confused on. Like she couldn't make out what it was is so like a perspective thing. Yeah. And, and I thought, man, this is, this is great feedback. So I, I set it aside, even though this thing had been approved and I'd already started inking it. I'm like, it's not good enough because my daughter doesn't understand it. So I went back and redid the covers, it's like a whole new sketch. And I felt better about it. Like the, cause before I was kind of like wishy washy on him. Like, I'm not sure how I'm going to ink this. It might be problematic, but I think this is good enough. I think I can make this work. Whereas when I went back to, for the second one, I felt like, aha, yeah, like this is better. This is going to work. This makes more sense. And I know how I can ink this and it'll, it'll be okay. And so I went and sent a sketch to the uh, vested parties and they all, they all proved it. And in addition to proving, they said they liked it more than the previous sketch. So I'm like that, that was like my aha moment right then. Like, okay, I got it. We're good. Uh, I haven't started inking it yet. <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I but you can see the vision. Though. Yeah, I know it's going to work out. But but it's like one of those things like where I don't get to have that aha moment as much because I, I'm doing new shit like every week that I'm like, I already trust my, my gut. Like usually when I send a sketch, it gets approved. Not, and I'm not trying to sound arrogant or cocky. It's just like, for whatever reason, like usually the first thing I output, 
I feel the most comfortable with. Yeah. And it's usually what gets approved by the customer. There's usually not a lot of back and forth. So like these aha moments start to kind of go away because I'm always like, I'm always like, oh, yeah, this is good enough. It's good enough. It's good enough. Every, every once in a while, I'll pause to challenge myself. Not to say that I'm not challenging myself at all, but um, it's it's not until I've reached that moment of struggle and I can have that like that that fresh new glance at something and have that moment of like, oh, I, I defeated, I slayed the dragon, you know. Yeah. And and I think it's cool. I do think that there is certainly some value in that in terms of like if that's what you're getting out of the creative process, that's awesome because like I said, about 90% of it is constant problem solving. Even, even when you're putting ink on paper, like I call it a meditative state, but I'm still making decisions. I'm still problem solving. Am I going to do stipple here? Am I going to do thatch work here? Am I going to do cross hatching? Am I going to fill this with black? Am I going to, am I going to go back with some white here? I'm making these decisions like on the fly. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, but I'm so used to it. I'm so that I don't, you know, it doesn't feel like, a problem that I'm solving it just is something I'm it's an action it's an activity I'm partaking in probably like how, when, how it feels like when somebody plays a video game you're on a journey you know and you're going to reach that end of that journey at some point um, you're just trying to enjoy the ride while, you, while you're on it so uh, I think it's cool that you find value in that that aha moment because every commission no matter if it seems simple or not it's always a problem solving moment yeah so you're going to have those, those, those aha experiences. Yeah. And they'll, they happen to everyone and, and vice versa. Everyone has those days where nothing is going right. Yeah. You know, too. Absolutely. So none of us are uh, alone in that. What's going on here. All right. What was the hardest project you worked on and what made it challenging? I was surprised. <laughs> How much do you want to disclose here? Because I know what's on the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was a healthy challenge. It was a healthy challenge, I, I would call it. It was just, um, it was weird getting that in my inbox. Um, because I was like, what? <laughs> so it's from their who? Who sent it? Was it from their management? It was or uh, his it, management, I guess. It was. Um, it was either. Um, was it Joe Perez maybe or Tony L Tony Lorenzo? Joe Joe Perez is a graphic designer. Um, J uh, Jerry Lorenzo, he is the creative director of a fashion brand called Fear of God. You can buy their clothes at like um, I don't know the mall, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's sort of like a boutique kind of thing, but he. Um, He's a creative visionary in his own right. And uh, he was tasked by, I think her name's Car Carla Welch, who is Justin Bieber's stylist. He was about to go on this purpose tour and they didn't have any merch yet or a look for like his stage presence set up yet. So um, Justin's apparently a fan of uh, the Fear of God brand, a clothing brand. So they she got... In, his stylist got in touch with Jerry. Jerry at the time was doing vintage t-shirts, like collecting vintage metal and hard rock and like hip hop t-shirts. And then like doing the same where he'd stamp his like fear of God brand on it. Sort of like as a, like a kind of like if you're digging through a, a, a treasure trove of things and you find these relics and you're like, Oh, look at this discovery I made. And you, you know, you put your, you slap your, your brand on, it. you know, it's, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting like high fashion sort of concept I guess at the time to like repurpose these uh, these old like vintage rock and metal shirts and hip hop shirts and stuff so that's kind of like what he was into on the side um, in addition to doing like his main brand his okay. main line so anyway he was thinking like okay cool we'll, we'll do this something like this for Justin Bieber and he was I'd already worked with him on some stuff in the past. Uh, like sort of like um he was like involved in some team i worked with on some some stuff that never got published like a year prior or something like that so he knew who i was he had my logos from hell book he really enjoyed that book he he thought i'm gonna reach out to mark so he he contacted me and put this on me like hey 
we need this in like two weeks <laughs> or something like that. Some crazy deadline. I'm like the dude's about to go on a national tour and you guys don't have your merch shit together yet is what I'm thinking. Like this is like, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, why Stadium have, tour. Yeah. Why don't you have this together? That's what I'm thinking. But I mean, I get stuff like that from metal bands too. So I kind of, kind of get it. Like art's always an afterthought. Right. Um, and I, I was like, it's it's a difficult commission in, in different ways. I would say one because I'm working with a creative director who who had his own vision of what he wanted and it was very specific. So I went through more rounds of logo sketches than I ever have with any customer I've ever had. Well, it's probably just like subtle little changes, right? A lot of it was. A lot of it was just like on the fly, like different concepts all together, like different yeah. looks. And this is like one of the more simple, like typographic kind of based. I think I actually like based that off like a simple typography. I can't remember what typeface, like a, some like Gil Sands or something. I can't remember. And I was like, okay, this is a nice, like clean letter form. Let me see what I can do to stretch this a little bit. Cause it's very legible. What can I do to make it look edgy? And that's kind of what I landed on with this sketch. I think it was something like that, but I had like 50, 60. I don't even know how many sketches I went through on this thing. And it's like a lot of back and forth. And I'm thinking, man, is this one? I didn't know if they were going to use it. Yeah. So I, it was sort of like an experiment and like, well, let's see where this goes. Let's see where this path leads. I didn't know. <laughs> what the out- I really genuinely did not know what the outcome was going to be. I didn't know if they were going to say yes or no to any of it. Even Jerry's concepts. I had no idea. I was out of the loop on that. So uh, my, my task was to come up with all these logo variants and, and I did, and they, they ended up settling on this one and ran with it as part of their tour package. And it was kind of like, it was, it was challenging in that regard. One, I had a creative director, and I don't want to call him difficult because he wasn't, he's a super cool dude, but definitely demanding, I would say, like, and, and had a very specific yeah. look that he wanted. And I, it's hard sometimes to get in somebody else's head, you know, because you're not that person. You, you do things your own way. So you're trying to like, get to where they're at you know and it's hard because this is somebody from like a hip-hop background i'm like dude i listen to fucking death metal <laughs> you know what i mean like i don't yeah. understand this stuff wasn't as much common ground and so on top of that there's that challenge there's a challenge of a tight deadline there's a challenge of i'm trying to achieve something that looks tough but also like a girl would wear like a 12 year old girl would wear you know what i mean so i'm like i don't that's not my demographic i'm mostly illustrating for shirts for metal bands you know that mostly dudes are wearing um so there's that aspect and there's also the the big risk take aspect of like here i am drawing for this pop musician you know and that's not my area of expertise at all yeah. how are people going to perceive that and part of me is like you know what this is an opportunity that's fallen in my lap I'm going to take advantage of it. The dude's asking a metal artist to do it, not just like somebody try to pretend to be metal, you know? So I was like, okay, there's a little bit of integrity in that, but also I understand like how the metal scene might take that the wrong way too. So I kind of get it, but to me, um, it ultimately was worth the risk. It, it kind of, it, I don't want to say it defines me as an illustrator, but it's something different that I did. It's, but I've done a lot of different things. I've done book covers, done magic. You know what I mean? I've done different things for a different product type. This is another different kind of thing, you know, and ultimately it's probably the most visible work that I've done. I would imagine in terms of like reach, you know, um, it's just, it's just a very different kind of experience. And even just to get it like a little peek into like how the pop industry functions. <laughs> yeah. You know, was I think this is fascinating, man. It, it, it was very interesting. And there's a lot of middlemen involved in this sort of thing. And a lot of wishy washiness and like not really fully understanding. Even with like some of the bigger metal bands I've worked with, same same crap, man. Like I, I'm like, where does this go when I'm done with it? I don't get it. Yeah. You know, um, like, I don't hear yes or no on anything. It just goes out and I never see it again. You know, it's just stuff like that. Um, that's a little mystifying to me, but this is challenging in a lot of levels, I would say. And even though it's just a stupid, simple logo, the, the what went into it was beastly. And actually, they did come back to me for the tour following this one, 
said, hey, you want to do some more work for us? And I turned it down. <laughs> they, offered me, <laughs> they offered me 10 grand for a logo and I turned it down. That's how much I did not want to do this again. <laughs> and I'm oh, like, man. That sounds stupid. Like that sounds like a poor business decision probably. But I just, I didn't want to, I wanted, I, I, I so much enjoy just like a band reaching out to me and being like, yo, we're going on tour. We need a t-shirt illustration. Can you do one for us in like a week? I'd rather do that. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Like, I'd rather spend my time doing that than going through this rigmarole again. And not to say I'm I'm not grateful for that opportunity that it came again. It just it just wasn't it's like I had been there, done that. You know what I mean? Like I tried it, I tested the water and it, it, it yielded an interesting result. It, but the experience was was challenging. So I hopefully that kind of paints a picture of sort of like what went on behind the scenes with oh, that. That's a great story, man. But um, I think it's funny too that like without context and everything you just said you've drawn some very intricate complex drawings in your time and the thing that you chose to be the most challenging to work on stupid logo. essentially is the logo and like it's stupid but, like, but it, it's oh, the what? truth of like getting simple good typography is so much more difficult in some ways or it's a whole different level of difficulty than like an illustration like it's a whole different yeah. challenge because well, yes you have to know what exactly what they're thinking because that I, kind of stuff it is and you know it's not i mean i've had challenging illustrations before i just worked on a challenging album cover a couple like a month ago yeah and you know it's like a customer that was very specific about what they wanted and that's cool like i the, the dude's awesome like he's, he's a he's a good dude it's just and they you know he, he i managed to get it done it was just tedious but this is a different kind of tedious and also the fact that I was risking my reputation as a metal illustrator on this yeah. it also made it challenging, you know, that I was gambling. Um, I knew I was still going to draw metal stuff no matter what, because that's what I do. But I thought, this is weird. Like You don't want to be called sellout and shit like that. And yeah, I mean, and it happened, and that's fine. I, I, I can understand that. But there was um, there's also a part of like a curious curiosity about like well where is this ride going to take me you know what i mean here's a creative challenge i have no idea if it's good, anything's going to come of it but i wanted to go on that ride just to see you know where it would go and yeah. that was part of um what made it challenging too is that sort of like that uncertainty you know that little risk but anyway did have, you, have you worked on anything that you found particularly challenging like what would you consider um, to be a, a challenging project? Current what? piece definitely is that's the most challenging pen and ink piece I've ever done. Anytime that I'm doing like a watercolor painting, that's a that's very challenging as well in like a different way, especially because yeah. watercolor is very time sensitive. So mm -hmm. I I'd say currently the the piece that I'm working on now is probably one of the most challenging ones because just because how much preparation I had to do. I mean, I I pulled hundreds of reference pictures just to work from in various capacities you know yeah. got some stuff from like the public domain i got you know i needed to make sure that like the costuming was victorian era oh so i got God. like a Victor victorian era uh photo of a wedding and then of like somebody being ill in bed and 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 nursing a baby like so i got all these like photographs from like the late 1800s yeah um so just a lot of digging and then i did two value studies and a preparatory drawing with a full perspective grid i mean the whole i oh, holy there crap. were no there i if i wanted to get the quality that i was looking for it was going to take time which yeah. actually i started this thing the third of march so 20 days for that amount of progress for me is actually pretty good. Yeah. Like I'm getting faster. I think that's, that's a part of the, the process that I think people don't really see is the preparation involved. Yeah. Like I, I can spend hours before I even sketch, you know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm trying to collect like references or collect like, how do I want to attack this? Like, especially yeah. you know, like perspective or something that you're not used to drawing. There's some stuff that's like really go to and easy for me, but there's some stuff I'm like, like what you're doing, like what you described. Draw somebody laying sick in bed. Okay, I mean I could do that right now, but it's not gonna look right. Yeah, I I want to research and study and see see what else is out there because 
you want to know how you're going to, what angle you're going to take on it, like how exactly. you're going to interpret it. But you need some information to to kind of to kind of call and pull that together. And um, I, I, to me, like what you're describing is absolutely like total self abuse because <laughs> it's a lot of work, man. Like all the like movie, even like when you look at the framing that you've done on that, it's ornate and it, it does speak to that that era, or at least gives me an impression of the time period. But you're you're looking at the uh, uh, oval frames and then you have the giant frame that encompasses the whole thing. So even just the framing alone requires some time and research, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I think people don't see that. Like when when you're sort of asked to draw something that's a little bit maybe out of your wheelhouse, that you, it's going to require some some studying, some research uh, up front, and that that could be hours. You know, uh, I even just recently, I think I had worked on something for a, a clothing brand where I'm like, okay, I can do that, but I'm I'm you know I'm, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna need some more reference points. You know, yeah, uh, these aren't things I typically would ever draw. And I want to make sure I, I do a reasonable job on it. So I'm not going to just haphazardly throw some together. I think that if you if you have a reference or a resource of some sort, it's going to help inform you. You're going to get a better result. Definitely. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you still put your creative spin on it. But it, it's just going to give you like a more um, <clears throat> convincing end product. T totally agree. And like I didn't use reference for a long time when I was like developing and while I'll, I'll talk about it a bit later, like imagination is incredibly important and not mm -hmm. relying on reference too much, but it's a very useful tool. Yeah, it is. Actually here, th this is a, uh, I think this is the last question. And I, this question, <laughs> this question I thought a lot about today and I, I have an answer to um, after you, but like, to me, it highlights the thing that I mean, people come to this channel for, for different reasons, right? But the people who, like, love the channel, from my understanding, a lot of them are aspiring artists. And when I see this kind of question, this is, like, geared for you guys. And that's part – that's one of the things I enjoy most about this channel is, like, helping people, you know? Yeah. And, like, and, like, I haven't, like – figured out everything with this whole thing. I don't have like an incredibly successful career yet with art, but I, I've, I've come a long way. And when I see people who are on their journey, um, I just, I just really enjoy helping out people and like kind of providing like informal, like mentorship and like advice that I hope is on good grounds. But like this question kind of served it up. So I was thinking about it a lot today. So Long-winded. I want to hear what you got to say. No, I'm I'm actually excited to hear what you say too because um, I'm in the same boat, man. It's it, it's you know drawing for the metal scene. It's because I love metal music and I want to be a part of the uh, the machine that it is. And if if I wouldn't do it if I didn't care about the music. Um, it, it it's. I think there is a lot of value in being being able to informa share information like this too. The the platform you provided through Heavy Art Talk is is huge. It's really huge, and there's you know I, I wish I had something like this when I was growing up, you know, getting into this stuff because it's a great resource and it puts it puts a person to these things that you see all the time. Yeah, you, know, you see the work and you think that defines a person, but it doesn't always, you know, it's just a part of that, who that person is. Uh, it's an expression, you know, that they're trying to achieve, but there's, there, there's a human behind this. We're not AI. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, um, yeah. So that's a great question about the 30 minutes. So I, 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 every once in a while, not, not every week, but every, you know, every maybe once a month or something like that, I'll, I'll just find a random image like in a newspaper or whatever. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to draw this because this is some shit I would never draw. You know what I mean? I would never use this in a finished piece. So these are just examples of, they were actually blue line sketches, like with a blue line pencil. Um, and just like looking at their, you know, just looking at a reference. You can see like imperfections. Like you, you also, you know, I'm sitting casually. Like I might be leaning back with a, like a, these are all from the same drawing book. Just leaning back with it on my, you know, resting on my legs. So I'm not like trying to achieve any expert level stuff here. I'm literally just trying to like 
look at something for what it is and translate it from here to to the to the pencil to the paper you know because i feel like having that there's so much of what i do that's intuitive that i don't have to think hard about that i want to i want to pause to like and it's thanks to your channel too because i feel like watching these other artists talk and watching your process and how how prolific you are with sketching and made me think okay i should be doing this too because i don't do it enough so every once in a while in recent year past year or so I, i've been picking up this pencil and just doodling like here we have people like diff different ethnicities you know in different states of emotion mm -hmm. i'm just literally looking looking at a picture and putting it down on, on paper because it's it's it, it forces me to look at things like well how does the mouth look when it's tilted up like this and open i mean i can visualize that in my head and maybe come up with something but having a photo reference is helpful uh, it helps you. I think the most most important thing it's helped me do is look at texture differently and also look at value differently because I'm not big on shading. Uh, a lot of the ink work I do is just like faux shading, uh, meaning like I'm not really trying to create anything uh, realistic. I'm just trying to give you like a general impression uh, that something's there even though it's not. Here I'm like really trying to look at where is it dark? Where is it light? And, and trying to pay attention to some of those things. So these are like literally just small like little blue line sketches that I just scan and grayscale them out. Um, but yeah, just, just something like that's what I do with 30 minutes in a, in a day if I wanna um, uh, build up my expertise, just draw something that I would normally not draw, puts me out of my comfort zone and forces me to think about an object differently than I normally would. How about you, Lee? I know you've, you've thought deeply about this. I want to hear your profound answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I cut out some of it. I was going to go ham, but, and uh, Dalton, appreciate it. Thank you, Gaz, as well. Like, see, these, these kind of things, like, it, this makes it worth it, right, Mark? You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. this kind of stuff, man. Yeah. It's, it means a ton, guys, really. It's, I, I feel like there's a lot of value, too, in, in being able to, like, show examples. That's why I'm always coming with these, these, presentations so to speak and i know you do a lot with when you do your panel discussions when you talk about other people's art yeah uh like some of the stuff lucas showed last time with his um his graduate project with the talking about data visualization and stuff i'm like man that's crazy i would never do <laughs> data visualization with with a piece of art you know it was fascinating yeah. to me that he was thinking so deeply about his work you know about what he's doing lucas uh, makes me feel dumb no, but, but the thing is, like, I, see, he's a great teacher because he's, yeah. he's done that. Yeah. That's why I feel like having these visuals here help. We're visual people, we're visual learners. So you have to have something to back what you're saying. And I feel like being able to show it is more than just saying it. I think there's more value in being able to show it, demonstrate it. Um, and I'm not a teacher, you know, I mean, it's, I, but I enjoy this knowledge sharing. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Please tell me your your two cents on this. Uh... Yeah, so here, here's my bullshit. No, I'm kidding. Um, so my perspective and also my regimen. So you have 30 minutes a day, right? That means this is how I view it, right? Train like an athlete, but instead of being an athlete, you're an artist, right? So being a good artist takes developing skills and then skills within skills, right? Yep. So in our world, and let's just take pen and ink illustration, right? The skills are sketch, tighter draw, ink, composition, texture, all those other things, right? All like the yep. fundamentals and stuff. But then the micro skills within there. So for inking, micro skills would be line weight you know yep. what i mean oh, yeah. like things like that so it's skills within skills so you have to think about not just training holistically but individually in those segments and also being aware of how wide of an artist do you want to go and or how deep or what combination right so there's some people uh that have a very specific style and they can't do much outside of that. There's nothing wrong with that. It just means that they have trained in depth instead of width. 
Right. And then you think of artists um, like the ones who maybe work for like animation companies or like video games. They're extremely versatile, extremely skilled. And they probably have a combination of depth and width, to be frank. Some, they're some of the best artists out there, but yeah, they definitely have that breadth. Mm -hmm. So when you're training, think about those things because it'll help you from maybe getting like shiny object sy syndrome. You know, you haven't quote unquote mastered a skill. And I say that in quotes because there's always room for growth, but you're kind of bouncing around, right? You don't want that either. So being intentional in your practice is incredibly important. So at any given point in time, this is my, my philosophy. You have a quote unquote big piece that you're working on. It doesn't have to be large. It just means it's your piece that you're working on with a serious capacity. So you have a serious piece and then anything outside of that is developing skills and exploring. So if I had to break down a week, Sunday, because I, let's say you work a nine to five Monday through Friday job, just for simplicity. That's what I do. So Sunday, you work on your current big piece. You spend a few hours on that. If you only have 30 minutes, okay, 30 minutes. Monday, and you can sub out of these things, right? Just all hypothetical here. Do a master study. Now, what is a master study? Preferably draw from somebody who is not operating currently today. That way there's no hmm. style mimicry or that issue isn't as much. Draw from people of the past. They don't have to be Renaissance painters, but they could be. They don't have to be Gustave Doré, who, but it's an excellent person to learn from. Yes. But I would say go, go, you know, 1900s typically, right? Some, some time in there. And then find 10 to 15 artists that speak to you. Like when you see their work, they just like inspire you and you know why they inspire you. And those are like, that's like your well to draw from. But make sure that they're masters. Like the better people that you're studying, the better your work's going to be. So you can be particular. So don't study me. Study somebody better than me. You know what I mean? Just like theoretically. <laughs> Whatever, man. You're a master. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, fuck that. But master ceremonies here, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Tuesday, draw from life and do gesture. So sketch quickly. So gesture, meaning like get the motion of something, get the proportions. Don't worry about all the details. Just get the overarching feeling, like a little bit of the anatomy in there. I, so, I love that. Can I pause you for a second? Yes. This is amazing, by the way, what you're describing, how you've broken this down. I mean, you're such an analyst. I love it. <laughs> um, I'm serious. I really mean that. Yeah. Um, this is something drawing with my my daughter, for example. Uh, I always see her trying to be so meticulous. About, she's, she's kind of, when I say meticulous, she's not like a tight artist by any means. She's still like exploring. Yeah. So her, her stuff is like, you know, it's kind of scratchy looking still, but she's very, very meticulous about the forms. I, I just uh, about a week or two ago, we were drawing the same character, uh, anime character she likes. And I'm sitting over here and I'm, I'm like doing these big ass loose gestural circles to kind of figure out where the body's going to be. Yeah. And she's like, uh, you know what I mean? Dr starting with the eyes already. You know what I mean? Yeah. But this is, my point being that this is so vital, your Tuesday exercise to be loose and not super intentional about something, just to be loose and gestural about it is so powerful and, and impactful uh, for, for every artist to be able to have that ability to make something that looks like shit, but gets the point across, doesn't have to be perfect. That's a great exercise. Anyway, I just want to pull that out because that's something that I feel like um, when you're growing as an artist, you have such a hard time divorcing your mind from yeah. to be able to say, hey, hey, it doesn't need to be perfect. Let's start loose. You know, let's scribble. You know, yeah. don't, yeah. don't be so intentional about everything. I right? think yeah. another thing, too, um, let's say that maybe drawing things realistically uh, is maybe not what you want to do right at this second, but you want to keep things gestural. You know who 
what type of artist was like a master at motion and gesture. Look at old hand-drawn animators mm. like from Disney. Yeah. Like, um, fuck, what's his name? Uh, there's a really big channel. He's a super nice guy. Uh, his name's Aaron something, but he was one of the main animators on Lion King and uh, Brother Bear. You'll find him on YouTube. Really friendly guy. He's a wildlife artist primarily. Oh, cool. But watch some of his gesture drawings of like characters from the Lion King, man. You can see the sense of flow in rhythm. Yeah. yeah. Like art should have rhythm in have it. Some sense of motion or activity, sure. Absolutely. Uh, well, that, that that's a that's a big thing for me. Like sometimes like you, uh, I know my stuff looks like very tightly rendered. But at the beginning, it's not like that at all. Yeah, it, it can be very sterile and rigid at first, you know. And, and it's, I think it, not that every piece has that motion, but I think that's a great quality or an exercise that can help push you into that into that yeah. realm. Um, it's a great, that's a great, excellent suggestion for a Tuesday. All of them are, but yeah, keep going, man. This is this is really good stuff. So then Wednesday, you want to keep focused on your big piece so you don't lose momentum. So. Let me mention another thing with the big piece. It should be your, if your comfort zone is here, your big piece should be here. It should always be just a little beyond your comfort zone. Always, always go a little bit above with that big piece. So Wednesday, you're working on that. Thursday, now here's the time for play and experimentation and those like aha moments that are, it doesn't feel like an exercise. Okay, so you draw from imagination. You have no reference. You have nothing. You just start putting shapes down, and you see what speaks to you. Aaron Blaze, thank you, Gene Mutation. That's who I was looking for. Yeah. Aaron Blaze is great, great instructor. Um, so draw from imagination because you'll be surprised what you can come up with, and it can help you find your own style instead of copying other people. Mm -hmm. So very good balance there, and it can fuel the inspiration for the next big piece and the next one after that. And the less you're thinking in that motion, like you should be kind of in somewhat of a state of Zen because there's no stakes when you're drawing from imagination. Friday, what are some of the other skills, right? So black and white pen and ink art, practice some inking. And what better way than ink some of the things that you've drawn throughout that week? Or for me, inking or watercolor, you know, painting is another really good skill. Uh, watercolor can be kind of unforgiving and challenging. And you need to use the right paper. <laughs> That's yeah. my advice. But uh, it's a good practice. And then uh, Saturday, return to the big piece. So you have that weekend block of just being focused on chugging away at your piece. But the, the trap that I found uh, when I was earlier in my artistic development was we've harped on so much about the strength of composition and the importance of thumbnails and the importance of those decisions at the beginning in the sketch, right? If you're working on a big piece and let's say it takes 50 hours, besides two to three hours, a lot of that time is rendering and tightening things up and finalizing it, you know what I mean, in various stages. And that's not exercising those other skills that really lead to whether drawing is successful or not. So if you're always just working on these big, long projects, you're not practicing enough sketching and the power of a sketch and a good drawing is the most important part of most illustrations. So you got to make sure you're always exercising that muscle. So you need to balance things across. So that's my spiel for like, if you want to train like an athlete, you can get good quick, do something similar to this. You know, it's interesting too. I'm seeing your outside of drawing time too. Those are good suggestions as well. Yeah. yeah outside of side of drawing um I, I think that even though i don't function like this uh, i'm just too distracted and too many things on my plate to like really i that's why with those other sketches it's like okay every once in a while i should i should be doing some of these things right yeah because um, i think this is extremely valuable and actually what i think would be funly is if we took your regimen and you get some of the artists you talk to on here and we all do your regimen for a week <laughs> and then, then we present this is what i came up with 
I think this is great because I would love to try this because this is stuff I don't make time for. If you asked me to do this, I would. But I think that this would be a fun exercise for some of the other artists you've had on here too, where you know, everybody gets together and you show like, here's a big piece I'm working on that I spent three days on. And here are the cool studies I did in between, you know, like Monday's exercise. Because I don't, dude, I never take the time to be like, oh, I'm going to look at Aubrey Beardsley, for example, and draw something in that dude's style. I mean, that'd be fun, but I would I ever take the time to do that. No, because I don't, I don't have the time to do it. I mean, I could try to make time for it, but you know what I mean? Like these are, these are great suggestions. I think these are going to improve you as an artist. Like anybody who follows this regimen will be improved as an artist, undoubtedly. Even myself, I just, I would love to do this, but I just, you know, realistically wouldn't be able to achieve it unless I was tasked with it. But I think this would be a fun thing to see some artists like, you know, put out just to see like, oh, what is this art? who's this artist looking at? Like who's Lucas Court looking at this week? Who's he gonna? Who's he gonna imitate? He's well, got some he, wide taste, that's for sure. He does. He does the stuff he shares with you guys. I'm like, all, yeah. all the other stuff. I'm like, wow, this is some stuff I never seen before. Um, I I think this this is excellent. I I, I actually really appreciate the way you've um, visually kind of broken down what what this approach looks like when you're talking about a deep dive in a particular area versus like looking outward. And yeah. collecting all, which is, I, I think of you as an artist who's more on um, the outward, but then you can, you can become central and do a deep dive. Me, I'm more like, whew, like this, my whole career, I'm like, whew. so I'm not looking outside the way that I should be to build my skill set. Like, if I feel like if I did that and made more time for it, it would help, it would probably benefit me, just a matter of like, Time is always the enemy. Like that's the hardest thing I feel like with everything I do is just the managing time. Yeah. But I do think there's there's a ton of value in these these suggestions and I think they're excellent suggestions. I'm kind of I'm also kind of curious of Lucas with his instruction background. I wonder what kind of um, taskings he gave his students. Like what yeah. kind of, what, maybe what kind he'll of, uh, watch this and he can kind of give me uh, his input. I mean, I bet I bet he'd be like if I had to guess, because we know each other pretty well at this point, he'd, he'd probably be like, yeah, those are good suggestions. Oh, Here's I, my like slight way I would do it differently. But well, yeah, I think not, not even that. I just like to hear what, because I think these are excellent too. I just like to hear what Lucas, what other things too, in addition to what you suggested yeah. that maybe he's tried with his students. Yeah. You know, that'd be kind of fascinating. But um, this, this is, these are great suggestions. And a great breakdown too of like how you might approach your your own work, you know. Yeah, are, you, are you looking inward and just straight down? Or are you looking outward and like collecting it? You know. Uh, really quick right. on that outside of drawing time. So, heavy art talk largely is this last point with listen to art community based podcasts for tips and emotional encouragement. Like we're talking techniques and we're talking things. But if you want like very specific training, to, these are the ones I would go to. I'd go to Proko on YouTube. So I was started by a guy named Stan Prokopenko. He studied at the Watts Atelier of the Arts out of California, which is a very, very good atelier, which is like an art trade school. Hmm. So a lot of art schools are more theory driven, uh, largely. Atelier is all about you draw no academics you paint sure. you know it's drawing and painting and that's it it, huh. it doesn't have to worry about academic stuff weird okay interesting it's more old school and classical you know yeah. and that kind of cool. passing. i would love to go to an atelier but that's a whole side quest right <laughs> yeah. but proco excellent educational content david finch does monday live streams he's a very well established comic book artist he's very good at Penciling, drawing, that's what they call it penciling in the comic industry, as well as inking, very signature style, strong light and shadow. Uh, Aaron Blaze, we were talking about him earlier, another good art instructor on YouTube. There's plenty of other ones. Kind of find your pack of like five. And here's the thing, man, like, yeah, oh, let's say you only have 30 minutes for <clears throat> drawing, but at work, you have a lunch break, 
When you're eating lunch, watch one of these videos. Uh, why are you going to the bathroom? I don't care. Watch some of these videos. Like if you're obsessed, you will find the time. So watch those channels and go along with those exercises on Facebook and Instagram. Be aware of what you're surrounding yourself with. So find like the best artists, right? Like there's Frank Frazetta, uh, art Facebook groups and Instagram, like follow that. And like, when you see a Frank Frazetta on your feed, stop for 30 seconds and analyze it. Why is this image successful? What were some of the decisions that were made there? Why were these colors used? Ask questions. It'll deepen your understanding because Frank Frazetta might be like one of the most recent masters, but he was still a human and he made human decisions. So you can dissect them in the same capacity. And then the last point is, it's not all just exercise and training and practice. There's the emotional support element and getting in a community of artists for the metal art scene. That's what I aim for this to be. But there's plenty of other art-based community podcasts too, especially in the tattoo community, um, as well as uh, Chet Czar. He does a Dark Society podcast. I think he does his episodes on Wednesday. Excellent channel. Chet seems like a very friendly, uh, nice guy too. So there's other ones beyond just heavy art talk as well, but this part is also important of like the emotional support and encouragement. So kind of see it collectively. Yeah. You know? It's awesome. Awesome uh, input. So yeah, there's my spiel. But yeah, I mean, I get very passionate about this stuff, you know, like the, I don't know. I've been very fortunate to get really good advice and insight from, from people in this scene and other artists and anything I learn, I try to pass on as well. I think that's good. I, I, I can tell you have a very genuine sense of uh, inquiry. And um, in addition to that, you're able to take this information that you're, you're uh, absorbing and analyze. You're very analytic minded. And you're very structured too, which is why I think you found some success with what you're doing. All those, all those moving parts and pieces, you might not see it when you look at an illustration that you've created. Uh, you know, people don't understand all those things that go into who you are as a person. But, but I can tell that these are some of the things that make you who you are, not just as an individual, but also as a creative person. You know, the ability to to analyze your ability to take this information and, and use it to your utility. Uh, just, it only makes you better at what you do. And not just that, I mean, there's a lot of other things that go into like, you obviously are very schedule oriented. You're very organized. That's why this channel is, is working out well for you because you have, you have these, these things in, in under your belt that, not everybody has, or some people might not be as good at, which is, which is, um, I think, uh, admirable. Uh, you know, it really, um, I, I appreciate what you're doing. And I know all the other artists who have been on here do too, but it takes a certain kind of person who's wired the way that you're wired to make this happen. I appreciate it, man. Always get a confidence boost anytime we talk, huh? That's all I'm here for. I'm just stroking egos left and right. Drawn stories. Oh, another one. I see. We got two questions here or two comments here. Another idea 30 minutes a day sketchbook comic. Create two characters in an ongoing fight scene. <laughs> Level up anatomy. Give you cool shots, lighting, et cetera. Yeah, excellent idea. That sounds like a headache. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. challenging. Yeah, because two figures crazy. interacting is, yeah. is difficult. Very I know. Difficult. I'm already putting that in my head. I'm thinking, oh my God, no. <laughs> it's a good challenge, though. It is. It's a healthy, very healthy challenge. But even just the idea of like, well, now I got to create a character from scratch. You know, that is a challenge. You know, like, what, who's my character? What do they represent? What is their skill set? And now I got to make them fight somebody else and draw it in sequence drawing? Man. It, it makes you respect like what comic book artists have to deal. Oh know, my god, arts. comic book artists are some of the best I mean, artists out there as well, man. Yeah, storytelling, sequence drawing, man, that's that's not for everybody. That's that takes a certain kind of mind to do that. 
Yeah. Gaz has a question. I, I got some input on this, but he's wondering about any uh, luck getting darker works in mainstream galleries. You want me to go or you got this? Um, I mean, I don't have a lot to say about that. I, I've shown in galleries in the past and they're usually like catered to weirdo stuff. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking maybe like trying lo locally to do some kind of public space kind of thing and just to see if they would even accept you know my style of art um in a public space but i i really don't know i haven't pursued it yet and usually those things i just i don't pursue because gallery stuff is kind of kind of expensive um to prep for and send work to and then yeah it's just it's not like something I it's, it's just not what you do yeah there's not, there's not a lot of reward from it um unless that's what you're into uh and maybe you want to share your work in that fashion that's cool I just yeah. I find that like most of the stuff that and you you've probably seen a little bit of too like dealing with in general like metal community you're you know looking at stuff to be in print like to be out you yeah. have that sort of um a wearable aspect you know or like here's something a, a product that I can enjoy as opposed to just showing something in a space yeah so it, I would say it, uh, I, I want to be polite about it, but why do you want to be in a mainstream gallery if you're producing darker work? Like the thing is a, a gallery, having your work in a gallery just by itself might not be what you really want to do. You know, kind of like what he's talking about, like most of the people on this channel and stuff are illustrators, meaning we get some type of prompt of some sort in a lot of cases and then we draw it in our way you know and like it's usually for a commercial purpose or it could be for ourselves but like that's so simply put i love it it's so true though man that's essentially what we're doing right yeah so i guess it's not that profound i i don't know if i'd even if if it was me i don't know if i'd even want to be in a mainstream gallery now i do know about like art markets and stuff where you could like produce prints and sell those and you could be around like some more typical like flower and boat paintings and shit like that. But I don't know if I'd really want to stick out like a sore thumb. You know what I mean? If, if the goal is to make more revenue and meet people, uh, you could try it for sure. Um, I guess you would just submit like a kit of your best stuff, but yeah, kind of knowing the space in which you want to reside means that sometimes you're not going to appeal to everybody and that's okay. And, you might not get picked because not because you're not good, more like you don't fit what the curator is going for. And it's so much down to their taste. So I think my advice would be consider if the mainstream gallery doesn't want you, maybe that's a blessing. You know, I kind of see it that way. Yeah. I just, yeah. um, my, my Christian's got some good input here too. I don't even have a lot of gallery experience. I'm speaking from either. from, I'm, from I'm, friends and stuff. I, I I haven't shown in quite a long like a couple of years, but um, I can't remember when the last show. I, I think it was um, one that um, rest in peace uh, Justin uh, Uber Cult put together it was probably the last show I did a few few years ago. But um, I never physically been to one. I just shipped the art. <laughs> That's so. This is the context. Sorry. I'm just reading oh, this here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's not give them a heart attack, you know, they're on their way to retirement home, man. I think that if they're, I mean, they're people too. They're, they should be able to appreciate what others are doing creatively, whether it's disturbing or not. I honestly, like, I, I, I'm trying to think back. Probably one of the most impressionable gallery experiences I had was when I went to college, I went to a gallery space, a professional gallery space. I think it's called the Witherspoon mm -hmm. in Woodsboro, uh, North Carolina. And I stopped by there and they were having a show. And this is a mainstream gallery. They had some kind of like off the cuff stuff here and there, but the, 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 um, this, this show that I, I happened to see there was, um, these enlarged photographs, larger than life photographs, they're, you know, 12 feet high by four or five feet, blown up images of cancer patients in various states of 
the process of dying, so to speak. There, I said it again. Um, and it was highly disturbing because it was reality thrown right in your face. And that was dark, you know, in a mainstream gallery show. And very obviously very impressionable and memorable because I still remember it 20, 30 some years later, 20 some years later. And uh, I think there is a place for, for dark art, even in the mainstream. It's just um, sometimes it is about knowing your audience, but it also, I think, like what Lee said, it probably is highly dependent on what a curator is looking for. And I don't know how the gallery process works for professional galleries. Um, some will retain the art and then sell it later. Like I had some stuff in a gallery in, I don't know where it was, Chicago or something. I, I got a PayPal payment randomly, and I'm like, what the hell is this? And it was from some gallery showing like from like five or six years ago that I've forgotten about. That I guess they still have <laughs> my drawings on their website for sale that I didn't even know they still had. You know what I mean? I, so it's just like, yeah, you might sell a piece, but he, you know, that's just an example, like something taking six years to sell or whatever, you know. So you, you, the reward is not really that great because when you think about the money you spent having the work framed and then shipped somewhere, and if you don't sell it, then you just lost money. Um, it's not very lucrative. I could see if you're trying to get your work out in space like that in the public, I would say go to a place like Maryland Death Fest, book a booth, put your stuff up for sale, like prints and originals. And that's like, that's the venue. That's where you'll, you'll get some, probably get some return for your, for your, your time spent in the product and the space that you're renting. You know, I just feel like some, that's like more appropriate if you're trying to, work in the metal community and get your work published in the metal community or getting your work on display somewhere, bring it to a show. Like if there's a local fest being organized, ask to vend there, you know, give that a shot. I've, I've, this is something I've thought about in the back of my head. I've never done it, but I feel like Bund, my friend Tannen, uh, he does it. He, he goes oh, yeah. to shows and, and he just is like, Hey, I'll pay the venue just a small fee and he sets yeah. up right next to the bands and it helps yeah. him get more clients. He's smart oh. about that. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's networking. That's free. That's your, you're paying, you're average, you're paying for, you're essentially advertising yourself. Yeah. You're not working, you're selling product. I mean, yeah. And then that's, that's why not, you know, if, if that's going to reap some kind of reward, then sure. Uh, mainstream. Yeah. I mean, it's, when you say mainstream, it's not like you're going to the matters, you know, it, it's just, it could be like a local gallery, you know, that shows local artists. I don't think you'd have a problem showing in a place like that. Yeah. I don't know. It's something I haven't really delved a ton into, but I, I, I don't, don't, I don't have that itch. I think it's, it's back to that thing of like being focused and like what Mark's suggestion is of like, if you're doing like metal art, you know, go where the bands are. Cause that's, who's going to pay your, you know, you're the, for the t-shirt design and stuff. So that's, that's really good advice. So opportunity cost. Yeah. Think about the, what's, what, what do you, what do you, what, kind of what you said up front, Lee, what do you intend to gain from it? Yeah. That, it's kind of goes back to also what I was mentioning about like having a little bit of foresight and be, being visionary with your work. Like where, where do I want my work to reside? Um, who am I marketing to? And not to say everything, everything you do has to be in that realm, because you'll find that as you go along in your career, people will, get it, people will notice and like want your stuff app applied to their particular thing, whatever it is, whatever product it is. It uh, might be outside of the music realm, but they just you know might want your, your approach and style. Uh, and that, that's that's okay too, you know. But just think about generally speaking, where you want to live as an artist, like reside, like visually, what realm are you going to be in? Another good advice here: make a zine. It takes a lot of work, but it there's it it's worth it if you can get some momentum. Very good yeah. advice. So all that takes, like that's a great suggestion. Uh, Subway does that with his little um, heads publication, and um, he has some other one that he did. I can't he had worked on. I can't remember the, the title of it off the top of my head right now, but I um, mean, yeah, I just doing a fanzine. All you got to do is like, let's say you hook up with like four distributors, you go to head split, you go to like Caligari, and then maybe you go to um, extremely rotten productions or maybe another European distributor. 
and you get your your little art zine distributed through those venues and you're good to go. Um, it might cost you a little bit of money up front for production and shipping, but the idea is that uh, you know you get the exposure. Maybe that's that's what I call like investing yourself sometimes. You know, it's considered advertising. You know, you, you might break even on it, or maybe you'll lose a little bit, but you're essentially paying f- for an ad space. And now you've you've associated what you do with all these labels who are distributing your product, which in turn means whatever folks order from those labels are inherently going to see your product too. Just added added to the exposure of your work. So it's just having a little bit of that. And, it, you know, don't be afraid to ask these distributors to carry your stuff if you are trying to do something like that. Carry art prints, carry an art scene, whatever. Uh, most of them you'll probably find them be friendly and totally take you up on it. Absolutely. <laughs> that's that, was, that, was, that was a good episode, man. We went long. It was on a weeknight, too. Oh, it was? Yeah. yeah. Actually, this, this one's going pretty long, too. We're almost at three hours now. We'll, we'll wrap up soon. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, to Christian who was in the uh, the chat here. And he probably still is, but uh, if you guys haven't checked out his work, he's really really good artist and illustrator. He just uh, so the band Scarcity has mm-hmm. an album coming out soon. It was just announced, and he did um, the illustration artwork on the front, and he also did the cover art for the latest Pelican album. Oh, really okay. good detail, like good atmospheric detail, like very, very well done pen and ink illustration. Oh, so cool. check out Christian's work if you haven't. I'll have to look it up too. And I see yeah. the colors with Morgrot. I didn't realize that I'm working on. And that's the way to do it, man. Drawn right now while, while you, you know, you don't want to see our ugly faces anyways. That's how you do it. All right. A couple more questions and we're going to, we're going to start wrapping up here. Uh, or at least this one. I mean, a zine scene can exist completely online, right? Yeah, and also just being able to spread it out to some of the folks who are interested. That's the same, like, like you think of Extremely Rotten Productions, for example. I mean, it's Denmark, so you, you might have a Scandinavian audience there. Maybe you send a, like, dry cough, and then now you've got an, a UK audience. You know, it's just like, you could go, it's a... a People are the people aren't as far away as you think, you know, and you can really find some success where there's a scene, which is pretty much this metal scene is global. So it's all about taking the time to be ready to like pack and ship stuff out. Um, I'm kind of when it, coming from the underground metal culture in the 90s. I mean, that's something we did all the time is you're, you're constantly at the post out shipping stuff. So it's, it's people aren't as far away as you think they are. Um, it's just like I said. There's a little bit of expense up front if you're putting your own zine and you know paying for the shipping and um, just getting buy-in from distributors to carry it. Uh, I, I I don't know what the scene like is uh, in Singapore. Singapore, for example, um, I know they've got actually I think maybe the band. I think is this band Singaporean Doldry? I can't remember. I, I've never even heard of the band. It's a cool think, shirt though, man. I, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, it's an Indonesian artist. Um, Muhammad, I can't remember what his handle is. He he drew it. I actually clapped with him once. He's he's awesome. Yeah, that's sick. Um, but I think Doldry, I think they might be like a Singaporean band if I if I remember correctly, or maybe they're Malaysian. I can't remember. But yeah, the, yeah, there's still. I mean, there's a scene there too. Um, What's the name of uh, your zine, by the way? Uh, Chowcalypse. Go ahead and post it as well, so we can check it out. I didn't mean to cut you off there, Mark. Oh, no problem. I was trying to think there was a, I think a zine from there that I worked with in the past called Regurgitation Zine or something like that. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's, there's a scene in Asia um, too. Even like if you look at Japan, if you're just trying to get distribution in Asia, you know, like Obliteration Records, um, uh, that's it. You know, the, the, the folks who run uh, Asakusa Death Fest, they're, that's a great distributor. Uh, I don't know if Death Rash Armageddon is still around in Japan and stuff like that. There's all there's underground scenes just massive. It's all it's worldwide. So, like I said, a little expensive front, a little bit of like work up front, getting something printed and shipped, and you're you're good to go. But again, like the way I see it is, you're you're just paying for advertising. It's like I get I get like um, 
like postcards printed, like flyers essentially printed and just have to pass through the mail, kind of like the old days, you know? So I'll, you know, I'll put money up front for, for that sort of thing or to do like little poster prints to send out or, or stickers or whatever. Uh, it, it's just, you have to be able to like promote your brand, even if it's, it's not all digital. It, I think there's some value in doing in print too, because that's a leave behind for somebody, you know, that can end up on, on somebody's desk you know, and they might, they might see it again and be like, Oh, I should reach out to this person. It's just, it's all networking, whether it's in print or on web. I mean, good, I, maybe going to shows is more successful than going to a library. You know, I, I, I maybe yeah. I do that. I think the other thing too is like mm -hmm. networking at shows is great. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I know I keep coming back to online, but if you want a zine scene, right. Uh, I know language barrier could could be an issue uh, if you're trying to get with other people, but like do like a, a YouTube channel that's about one zine person running it and you interview and talk with other people running zines, kind of like what I do here with artists, you know, find your niche. But the, the world is big online. So I, I guess my advice just keeps coming back to online. But um, if you want it to be in person, go to shows. That would probably be the biggest thing but at yeah. the same time it's like dude neither of us have been to singapore so i'm not qualified for that or if i run a zine i'm just going off of how i have networked online via this channel you know do the same thing yeah. so i hope that's helpful and i appreciate all the kind words um chocolates it's cool well, cool um I think this has been a ton of fun, man. And really active chat too. Grateful for all you guys. Seriously. Yeah. All right. One last question. This is the last one. Dalton. Tough to answer. <laughs> I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. If you're cool. just starting out. So when I started out, I mean, granted, it was different then. This is early 90s, snail mail. I would do a lot of stuff for free just to get published. And even now, to this day, every once in a while, I'll do favors for, like, frequent customers. I might throw in an extra thing or whatever, you know, like a sleeve print or whatever. Um, or, like, filler art for a fanzine. And it's only because, like, I have, um, uh, I guess, a big place in my heart for these sort of DIY an antics. And um, I feel like doing some stuff for free just to get your name sort of out there, get your work in print and published is okay. Like when you're starting out to do that on occasion, just to do some freebies here and there. But if you're looking to charge, like, I mean, I was charging super cheap when I started moving into charging. I was, I'm talking like 50 bucks for a drawing. So yeah. I mean, Chris, Chris Moyen, the same deal. Like he's like, what do you do? Like the Beharit album cover for like, 75 bucks or something you know what i mean and that thing's like <laughs> you know um and, and you know it, times are different now obviously things cost more now um if you really want me to i i can't i can't put a value on on dalton on your art because you, you have to think about how you value your your own time and what your own time is worth and i don't know if you work a day job but or what you get paid per hour but if this is your personal time, think about like what you're getting paid at your day job. And like, do you value your free time more than that day job time? Probably so. So you might want to charge a little bit more than what you're making hourly at your day job. Uh, just to kind of make it worth your time because this is your free time that you're, you're sacrificing to, to give a product to somebody. Um, also consider like, what is the reach? Like, who are you working for? Uh, how is it being used? That might dictate what the cost or what you charge. Um, I don't know. To me, like I'm thinking, like if you're if you're talking like really cheap and you're trying to get published, maybe 150 bucks. I'm just throwing that out there as a general, just for like an initial like, hey, here's a t-shirt illustration for 150 dollars. And you think there's like three dudes or four dudes in a band or whatever, they're gonna be able to cough up like 50 bucks each to pay for a nice t-shirt illustration. You know, it's not going to break their bank. 
And when you think about like what you might pay for your electric bill, it's probably 150 bucks. So it's like paying a bill. It's not that, and you get a product, you get something from it. You they, And they might use that on a demo cover or their CD cover too. You might have like more purpose than just one, one place to live. It might just not be on the t-shirt, it might be on other things. So, I don't know, I'm just hypothetically throwing something out, but it's up to you as the artist to decide like what your, what your worth is or what your value is or what you think is fair because you want to be attainable. Uh, and there's no such thing as a ripping somebody off because you, if you, if you say you're worth this much, they should pay you this much, whatever that might be. Uh, don't let people talk you below what you, what you think you're worth. Um, if you're dealing with like a corporate entity, for example, they usually have a budget, they'll throw a budget at you, like what they have to spend. It just, it just depends like what you think is fair, uh, for your time. Yeah, I think that's a fair question to ask it when is. you're in the negotiation process. Do you have a budget set aside for this project? That's a that pretty direct question. question. They mm -hmm. then tell you, it's and then you, you have the option to accept or decline. But yeah, if you're exactly. just starting out, I mean... I'll give you a direct number uh, if you're just starting out and it depends on how much time goes into it, but I would probably not take anything under $50. Once again, just starting out in commissions and I probably wouldn't ask for more than $200 unless it took a lot of time. If you're trying to get your name out, but also get a little bit of money. So that's very loose. And the more experience you get, the more you can ask for more and supply and demand. So. Yeah, I, I think there's some, you want to be attainable, but you also want to be respectful of your, your own time. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to price yourself out like where you'll never get a commission, um, but you also want to be uh, affordable. You yeah, know, I'd and, say and put, make, the, put the ball in their court first. What's I your budget? That's, that's and then you can advice. accept. That's great advice, actually, Lee. I, that's something <laughs> I wish I had advice on that one. When I was younger too, you know. Well, this um, comes back to my day job, man. Mm -hmm. Like, th th this is what I do for a living, man. Yeah, like, is this yeah, kind of stuff? Right. Yeah, in, in my yeah. corporate job, and it's not that far off from the business side of art. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A good so, point. I hope that was helpful, Dalton. Um, just you know. Yeah, you can and, always turn a, You can always turn something down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, cool. Well, I appreciate everybody in the chat. Mark, you know, we'll be talking again soon. Yeah, and uh, I think it's a bad. really helpful, helpful session for uh, everybody. And it's also, I think, helpful for us too, because like you're talking about when you get these questions and stuff, it gets you to think about things more intentionally where we have yeah. a rhythm, we have our, our yeah. daily lives and stuff. So to like step back and, and think, systematically about things actually helps us as well so yeah it definitely does yeah absolutely all right cool thanks for, thanks for having me lee i appreciate it thanks to the folks who tuned in or or watch us after it's been posted i i appreciate everybody's um time and support that they've taken out to to digest this uh video stream appreciate it <laughs> yeah of course all right see you guys mark you stay on for a minute sure. have a good one see you guys